Come on in, you can find a seat. I gotta hold that way away, don't I? So good morning, welcome to Lawrence Technological University. My name is Don Carpenter and I'm one of the hosts for this event along with the Water Resource Commissioner's Office and Pure Oakland Water. As you probably saw from some of the things that Alyssa has pushed out, uh, this is our sixth annual summit. We're really excited. Didn't know when we started, we'd still be here six years later, but so far so good. Uh, we were just checking the most recent registration numbers and we're at a little over 200 people, uh, including the walk-ups today. So again, that's really exciting to have 200 people that are interested in water management, stormwater management in, in Southeast Michigan. So for me, this is always a, a great day because it gives me an opportunity to say hi to a lot of people. I, I recognize probably 75% of the audience and if I, I don't recognize you or if I haven't met you yet, I will do the best I can to meet you. I'm making her job hard. She's trying to capture a picture of me and I keep walking away from her. <laughs> so I don't sit still very well. It's never been part of, my, um, part of my philosophy or demeanor to be still. I tend to be in motion quite a bit. So with that, I, I do have to uh, acknowledge uh, Dr. Verinder Modgill, uh, the president of Lawrence Technological University. He has always said hello and welcome to this audience. Unfortunately, he could not be with us today. And so he sends his regards and appreciation again for what everybody does to promote environmental activities in, in Southeast Michigan. He's a, a big proponent. For those of you who uh, know anything about Dr. Modgo and his history, uh, before he came here as president, he was provost at Oakland University and, and really did a nice job trying to push environmental uh, advocacy and awareness in that position as well. So he sends his regrets, but he's happy to welcome you to our campus. And so with that, I'm gonna introduce Jim Nash. Jim. Thank you so much, Don. I really appreciate it. This, this is a great university um, that uh, is, again, on the forefront of environmental programs. Um, when I first elected in 2012, one of the first hot phone calls I got was from Don talking about how we could work together, and we've been working together ever since. Um, so this has been from the very beginning. I, my first year in office, I wanted to make sure that we really approach all these issues that we have in, in a regional basis. We've got to do that. We can't just do it as individuals each town or each county doing it themselves, this is a region. This is a whole area that we all depend on each other. My, uh, my county here, um, we're the, the headwaters of five watersheds. So what happens here goes downstream and we gotta make sure that we're protecting that here because the downstream end is the Great Lakes and we have to protect that. Um, most of the people here have, a lot of people here have been here several times at least and I'm glad to see people coming back. It's good to see new faces. Um, that, uh, that we all are working in the same direction. Um, my office has been doing this for quite some time. I don't think Alyssa's in here, my uh, personal assistant who is just the driver of all this and she does an amazing job. Um, JC Garrison helps too. Uh, my other have a bunch of staff that does a lot of work on this so I wanna thank them. Um, Don again has done this for a long time. Um, my office uh, does a lot of education. It's in our permits. We have to do a lot of education. Unfortunately, we don't get a lot of money. So um, we have a nonprofit that Don sits on, um, a bunch of folks in this room sit on. Um, we have been able to use uh, a, a lot of fundraising to, um, to fund scholarships. We're gonna talk about that in a minute here. Um, of, of internships at all the watershed councils. Um, we've done, just this last year, we've done uh, small mini grants for three projects, one in each of the watersheds for, uh, for make, just making sure we have the best technologies on demonstration, that we're doing the best things we can for these things. So it's all around education because again, in Michigan, I've lived all over the country and people are just aware of protecting water here more than any place else I've ever lived. So it's not a hard sell just to tell people that if you can do a few things, we can make some real difference in our water quality. People are very much up for that. I would love to see in the coming future, in the coming years, um, have a couple of maybe ballot initiatives to do some funding for these programs. Legislature isn't doing it, so we need to do those kind of things. Um, so Pure Oakland Water, which is my nonprofit, um, we have two scholarship recipients here today. Are, where are we? Come on up here. Um, Josh Bauer from Lawrence Tech, this great institution here. Rachel Taylor from Rochester College. We just started our inter, uh, uh, scholarships there. This is our first year doing one, so we're proud to. Uh,
My generation has left them with a huge mess to clean up. <coughs> <coughs> so now we're trying to help this next generation take care of that mess that we've left them. And I want to acknowledge that my generation has done that, by the way. So um, we have to depend on folks like this to do that work. And they have told me that they're planning on getting the water field. Again, in my mind, this is the most important thing we do. Even the, the, um, the air pollution that is in our air ends up in our water. So that's why we have issues around mercury. So these are the folks that are going to hopefully cure that problem in the next generation. So if, if uh, did you want to take a picture? Please. Well, thank you so much. For the, your future, all you're going to do, thank you. Appreciate it. So today we're going to talk about a whole bunch of cool stuff. And um, I love this. I might not be an engineer, but I still love this stuff. Um, these first two speakers are, gonna, are working on a project in the Clinton River watershed. They've been doing one in uh, Ann Arbor um, to really get into where we have to have data. We have to know what's happening before we can come up with the solutions that matter. So this is one of those things. Um, so we're going to have, I, I guess I'm introducing them? Okay. <laughs> Our keynote speakers are uh, Bronco Kirkhez, who has a PhD and is a co-presenter with Brandon Wong with a PhD from the University of Michigan, uh, engineering faculty, uh, faculty real-time stormwater monitoring they're going to talk about. So come on up, guys. Thank you so much. Oh, you don't want that. Yeah, we're good. Thank you. Okay. Okay, good morning. How's everybody doing? Great. All right, cool. Every time I ask the students how they're doing, they're always like, some of them are always like, eh, um, which I feel like is, is pretty honest. Uh, okay, so is there a lot of reverb here? Yeah, there might be that mic over there. Mm -hmm. It could be that. Do you want to turn it off? Yeah. Let's fix it. We can do techie stuff. Let's go. That one's off. I can probably, t let's see if it's mine. Well, I teach lecture. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, so, uh, good morning. So, I'm Bronco. I'm in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. I've been at the University of Michigan for about five years uh, as an assistant professor. And that's Brandon. He finished his PhD with us recently. Um, back story on us is that we've been having a hair drying competition. <laughs> to real-time uh, sensing and control. Can I just talk? Is that okay? Can you hear me? No, you need the mic. I need a mic? Okay, cool. So, uh Okay, so let's just kick it off. I'm going to show you a picture that I showed this semester to uh, the students I was teaching. Um, and some of you have seen our talk. You've seen some of this before, and we promise we'll get some new stuff for you today. Um, I'm teaching freshmen this semester on the idea of smart storm water systems, uh, sp specifically smart water systems, actually. Um, and I showed, this, uh, I showed this the first day of class to show them that even, you know, they actually, a lot of them don't even remember this, right? But, like, it hasn't been so long that we went from basically taking, if you will, analog measurements of the world, the ones we can see, to something that's the size of a uh, fingernail right now that basically gives you, in this example, temperature and humidity, right? So in a very short amount of time, we've gone basically to the possibility of instrumenting our environments. And I think a lot of you who kind of work in the water sector have heard the, uh, the idea of smart cities, right? It's being thrown around right now. I think, you know, the real question is what does that actually mean? But oftentimes when you see this talk that's, you know, given by CEOs and stuff, everything's connected and looks kind of cool. But um, the question that we ask in, in our lab is what does this actually mean for water, right? A lot of people are talking about self-driving cars. I mean, just go outside here and you see a lot of that um, research being conducted. Um, but we specifically kind of wondering, like, what's going on for the water sector. And today, obviously, in the context of uh, what we're talking about here, we're going to specifically focus about storm water. So we give this talk uh, broadly. So obviously, you know what storm water is, but this is our icon of how it washes off and goes somewhere, right? So this is, when we talk to high schoolers and other people, we kind of show this slide. Um, as the commissioner was just uh, talking about earlier, this is a regional problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you where we're working, and we're actually going to tie it back together um, to this region. Uh, 
and how, how the research that we're doing sort of applies there. So here's the state of Michigan. We get the whole thing in here. Um, and uh, this is the city of Ann Arbor, right? So even a city that I think, well, you know, is fairly affluent, relatively speaking, um, still has issues with, a lot, uh, with its storm water. And this is just an example of what ha can happen in downtown Ann Arbor during a large storm event. So, um, you know, like many other cities, it's sort of like just contending with these um, issues. And, and, and the, the, the watershed I'm going to focus in on, and I think a lot of you are familiar with it because it's your neighboring watershed, is the Huron River. So this is the Huron River watershed. Um, we got Rick Lawson over here from the Huron River Watershed Council. Hey, Rick, we've been working with them. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in, and I'm specifically going to look at Ann Arbor, and then one subset of Ann Arbor right here that's called Mallets Creek that's probably one of the ones that gets the most attention just because it's heavily urbanized, right? Um, and so what I'll do is I'll take a look at Mallets Creek Watershed, which is about 10 square miles, right, Brandon? So the way it works is basically it rains, and then all the flows kind of meander through here and exit to the Huron River right here. Um, and as I mentioned, it's heavily urbanized, and it kind of faces a lot of the challenges that we see in these kind of urban environments. And so when you have flooding, when you have water quality impairments, what you do is you start fixing them, right? We just want to fix stuff. So that's, I think that's a lot of like the, the underpinnings even of today's meeting. Um, and a lot of the ways that we go about it is what used to be called best management practices. I think now they're called stormwater control measures. Um, I'm not sure if actually anybody knows why that term was changed, but if you do, let us know afterwards. Um, so, so essentially we put these things in because we want to fix the watershed, right? Um, everybody wants to do that. We want to kind of reduce flooding. We want to improve water quality. And so what we do is we go, you know, since we don't have the money to delete the infrastructure and start from scratch so we don't have the privilege like let's say for for the iPhone or for cars or whatever we can just redesign the whole thing we got to fix one piece at a time right so these piecemeal fixes fix this neighborhood fix that neighborhood so maybe we'll put in a pond and we'll put in a bioswale over here and in particular today, we're talking a lot about distributed inf infrastructure, like green infrastructure and some of these other solutions. And so the question that we asked just about five years ago when we started working on this is, um, how do we know that these, these individual fixes are actually adding up to a greater whole? You know, as you mentioned earlier, how do we know that this is actually working? Um, and we started reading papers on this. Um, and the idea was, if you start putting these everywhere, and in particular at the time when they were called best management practice, does best plus best plus best plus best actually equal best? And you would think intuitively, well, it should. How can I be fixing all the parts of my system and it somehow doesn't add up to a greater whole? Um, and there's a really sort of simple conceptual example that shows you how, how that can happen. So what I'll do is I'll sort of zoom in on these two locations right here. Um, and I'll kind of show what could happen in these neighborhoods. And let's say we start pre-construction. So um, what I'm plotting here is the hydrograph over time, so the flow of water over time right here. Um, and what we'll do is we'll plot site number one, site number two, and then how they're adding up to go out to the watershed. So here's site number one. So it has, you know, it has a flashy hydrograph, so it's not so good, so we want to fix it. Here's site number two. Also, we might not look how, you know, we, we don't like how it looks, so we want to fix it. And they might add downstream to give us some sort of like compounding effect like that. So this plus this is equal to this. So then we go into those neighborhoods and we fix them, right? Um, for the lack of a better word. Um, and this is how we would fix it. We'd maybe install a stormwater pond here, maybe install a bioswell over here or something like that. And you know, we look at this and say, well, that looks better, right? Because it's attenuating the hydrograph. And even I teach, you know, senior level hydraulics and I tell them, hey, this is how you design this and you know it's better because you're doing attenuation. Well, if you're not careful about how you're attenuating these hydrographs, they might actually add up before, you know, mad, add up now, whereas before they didn't, right? So you're changing the timing here of these flows. And if you're unlucky about how you change that timing, they might add up to give you worse conditions than you had before at the outlet. So if we're basically trying to, you know, improve water quality at these receiving water bodies, could it be that all these things that we're implementing could be adding up to be worse? I mean, there's no way to know, but the point is that you know, it could be one way or the other. It could be better, it could be worse, but how do we know which one it is? And there's a, there's a phenomenal paper that came out of Baltimore, and this is the one that really just blew our mind when we read it, where they, um, and I think some of you who's, who've met us before know about this study that we always keep citing. They took the whole entire city and they ran the swim model, so the, the storm water management model for the city, and they ran it as it is constructed with all BMPs in place, and then they deleted all of them. They went into the model and deleted it. They created a system that was just pipes, right? And pretty much everybody in this room would say, why in the world would you ever build something like that? That sounds terrible. Well, in that particular study, the one with just pipes had better flows at the outlet than the one with all the BMPs, right? And why is that? Well, in that particular case, uh, you know, we're not looking at system level solutions. We're just hoping that these individual fixes are going to add up to give us a greater, you know, greater good. And that might be the case or it might not be the case. And I guess the question is, how do we know? And how do we design system level solutions that actually have the outcomes that we're looking for and not just, you know, have the hope that sort of things are going to add up and give us what, um, what we want. And so, uh, 
you know, there's various ways to do that. There's obviously just a way to take system level approaches to do this. And ours was, you know, we like technology, so that's what we did. Uh, we, we wrote this paper uh, like four years ago now, three, four years ago, that sort of said, well, okay, people talk about smart cities, but what's stormwater look like in a smart city? And so we kind of said, okay, well, what if you had a city and it was covered by sensors, right? So sensors that measure everything from soil moisture and flow in your pipes and flow in your, you know, flow in your open channels and like ponds and basins and everything. So that's step number one, just measure it so you know what's happening at the system scale, okay? And once we know what's happening, how do we change the system? Well, one way to change this is to reconstruct the system um, and build you know, different solutions. Another one that we've been kind of talking about, and this is what Brandon's gonna talk to you about, is could we actually attach actuators to these? So valves and pumps and gates that adaptively open and close during a storm to effectively redesign your whole entire watershed in real time. So what I want you to think about um, before I pass it off to Brandon is, Think self-driving cars, but like for water, right? So if a watershed can control itself and be really, you know, you know, I use this in air quotes, smart, then um, what would it do? So Brandon can show you some of that. Cool. Hey, everyone. So um, what would that look like? Here is an example of the things that we're building in our lab. And it's really just taking the cell phone that's in your pocket, deconstructing it, taking away the screen, and then putting it in a nice enclosure so that we can put it in the field so it doesn't get damaged when it rains, the one thing that we actually want to measure. So what we've done is we have that green board right there is that cell phone. And attached to it is the, is the same modem that we use to like send data, stream YouTube, all of those things. And we're using that to stream all the measurements that are coming from these different sensors. So we can get a measurement of what the rainfall is, what the depth of the water is, and how those are changing over time in response to, for example, when it rains, how does a water level go up? How quickly does it go up? How slowly does it go down? Um, and also looking at some of the other parameters that are interesting with hydrology, such as like the soil moisture, like before an event, um, as well as tracking the water quality and how that changes in response to rain. And on top of that, we're also able to connect a number of different things, like Bronco mentioned, um, some valves, and those allow us to um, control the flow of water dynamically, um, just instantaneously redesigning our infrastructure on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, as opposed to, say, pouring concrete, which may be like a 20-year or 100-year cycle. So this is a very new, innovative way of redesigning our infrastructure as need be, depending on what the event is. Um, and then this is how we connect it all together. So um, what we're looking at here is a diagram of, on the left side is all the hardware that we just looked at. So the, the sensors, the electronics, the valves, and the gates, and those all connect to the internet and they stream to the cloud. And so on the internet is where we keep like our Amazon server and all that data goes into this database and it gets processed and analyzed and from there we use that to make decisions and also tell stories about it. So this first thing here is just a dashboard that we use in our lab to get a sense of what does everything look like, is everything okay? It's like our you know, NASA command center for us. And then in the, in the middle here, our phone, that's where we can get like pop-up alerts and see like, oh, we gotta go fix something. And hopefully we do, and usually we do. And then, um, and then the bottom part, that's the really cool stuff. These apps and real-time models is where we take all this stuff and we start getting into the space of autonomous cars. And from there, we have these models, like a, say for example, a swim model. It's taking in all these measurements, processing them, running them, and taking into account weather forecasts, running that forward so that we can see, oh, where's the water gonna go? And how do we anticipate what actions we should take? And once we have those actions in place, we'll send that back through our database to the hardware here, and then instantly start changing our infrastructure. And so what does that look like? Here's, um, here's an animated picture of how that is in the field. So in the top left, that's one of the um, valves that we've installed in the field. And then the other two pictures are of the same site. And so what we've effectively done is now we can take a single site and turn it into a, um, a detention pond or a retention pond or blur the line and turn it to anything in between. And we can also dynamically adjust what the flow rate is gonna be at any given moment. 
And so when cycling back to um, when we're adding in this infrastructure, how can we start changing the flow so that best plus best perhaps does start to look more like best? Um, say, for example, we have these two neighborhoods and they both have some inline storage and one gets a larger storm than another. And this is the, um, over here, this graph is, how's the pointer work? Yeah. Um, this is the hydrograph that we see downstream. And then by attaching on these two valves right before the downstream at the outlets of each neighborhood, as well as coordinating with this controller, we're now able to attenuate the flows in a more coordinated fashion and keep the flows below some sort of threshold like an erosion or flooding threshold. And so that's all nice and well when we're talking about it hypothetically, but then we have actually gone out and myself and all the students in our lab have gone out and built this. So this is again looking at Mallet's Creek, and each dot represents one of the sensors that we've deployed out in the field. And then as we go around, we're looking at all different sensor nodes. So some of them are measuring soil moisture, some are measuring the depth. Um, that's um, one of the control valves up there, and we're also connecting these electronics to like an auto sampler so that we can also measure their water quality. So things like phosphorus, nitrates, nitrites. Um, and really just getting a sense of what is the picture of the watershed at any given moment. And then here what we're looking at is one of the valves that we've installed at a basin. And so that's Gerardo, one of the students that's been working with us. And the whole process from when we first like broke ground to installing the electronics to when it's finally done. And here we're seeing an example of the water being released from that basin. And so I just want to zoom out a little bit and say, well, what about on a system level scale? What does that look like? And so here's that basin here. And then the red dot is where that outlet is. And about a mile or two downstream is a, is a wetland, a treatment wetland. And so the first part is a sediment bay where a lot of the sediment gets captured. And then it snakes around this treatment wetland here, and that's where there's a lot of native plants where nutrients get uptaken and removed from the water before it gets discharged to the Huron River. Um, and the, the problem that we'd ideally like to solve is um, when there's a large rain event, instead of getting all the benefits from the treatment, it'll just bypass and overflow and go directly into the river. And so is it possible to take advantage of these system level benefits? and? Um, optimize the efficiency of this infrastructure. And so what we did was we went out and we collected the data to look at this. Um, and also we collected some videos to prove that we're actually doing something and not fabricating it. <laughs> so what we're looking at here is um, this is the, the depth of the basin right after we release that water and open up the valve. And then that second graph is about an hour and a half later, we see the response from that water coming through. And we're very confident that this is in response to us releasing this water because we had waited for terrain and then another 48 hours we waited before releasing this, waiting for all the other weather systems to come through before actually making this effect. And you can see here's the wetland, or sorry, the water level going up from the red line to the green line. So we're actually getting these effects in the real world. It's not something, it's, it's you know, it's, it's real. Um, and so some results. The, the impacts that we can start to achieve when looking at things and optimizing one, optimizing on a system level scale. Um, so the treatment, now that we're treating, oh, let me step back to the capacity. So now we're effectively passing through an extra 7.5 million gallons through this wetland by using the upstream basin as an extra piece of storage. The, um, the cost per treatment has gone down, the cost per gallon to treat this water has gone down, and the amount of total phosphorus per year has gone up from 600 pounds to 800 pounds, so that's an increase of 200 pounds. Um, and then effectively, um, the numbers that we've been told by Washtenaw County are that this amounted to about a $1 million <coughs> amount in savings from building like additional storage infrastructure. So all from about like $10,000 worth of electronics and equipment. So, 
the question that I have to pose to the rest of the audience and also to Branka, which he'll answer is, does it scale? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so just to, just to basically reiterate what Brandon was saying, is we, we essentially come in, and this is all open source stuff, so if you want to do this, it's all yours. Um, we we, you know, we kind of convinced the school to let us do that. Because um, as we're seeing, as he mentioned in this case, it actually might be worth some money. But basically our goal was to open up the hood and say just here it is, like for the taking. We're a university and it should be everybody. So if you go to openstorm.org, you can just copy all these plans. But effectively we would come in, we put in these sensors, we put in this valve, and the, com the benefits start compounding very quickly. As soon as you put a valve onto a site, you can close it. When you close the valve, you capture sediment. When you open the valve, you release the water. If you release the water, you know, after a storm, it actually goes through the wetland instead of bypassing it. So it starts compounding throughout this. And effectively, as Brandon said, the county estimated. So this is in close collaboration with the city of Ann Arbor, the Huron River Watershed Council, and the city, uh, the Washtenaw County. This site would have had to been uh, five million gallons larger to have the same effect that we, we created with this valve. So basically for five to $10,000, you get a pretty big amplification on, on your existing infrastructure. So instead of building more, you can effectively repurpose what you have. And so as Brandon said, well, that's our, those are our examples in Ann Arbor across 10 square miles. The question is, does it scale? And so um, I'm about to show you something that we presented just this Monday. So for those of you who've seen our talk uh, before, this is brand new right here. So um, we, submitted this as part of, so WERF and WEF, so Water Research Foundation, uh, Water Environment Foundation had this uh, smart water competition. It's the first one they're holding, it's a national competition, and they just solicited submissions. Like you submit and there's like a prize and stuff like that. And so we submitted a project that's not in Ann Arbor, we actually submitted in something here in Detroit. So this is a collaboration, university uh, utility partnership with GLWA and University of Michigan. Is anybody from GLWA here? Okay. Um, uh, but I'll tell you about what we did with them. So uh, uh, this is essentially it. So we looked at um, we looked at the GLWA system, and the idea is, can we take what we're what we're working with here and apply it to a larger scale? So what you're looking at here is the you know the service area of the GLWA system. In fact, you know we're we're part of it here, right? And what we did is we sort of teamed up to look at um, some of the larger basins on the um, on the river. And so here you see Connor Creek. Some of you might be familiar with the CSO basin right here. It's about 120 million gallons of storage. Um, and effectively what this facility does is it sort of feeds to the larger interceptor, which then goes through a number of pump stations. I think Fairview is one of the really big ones that sort of crosses over. And eventually it all feeds to the treatment plant, which, you know, by many estimates is by, well, definitely is the largest one in North America, but it can be one of the largest ones in the world. Um, depending on what kind of storm you're, um, you're doing the measurement on. And so the idea was, can we take these kind of ideas of controlling valves in the smaller stormwater systems and really scale them up? Because Detroit, as it turns out, um, and the Great Lakes Water Authority system has a lot of control assets already. They have control, they have CSO basins, they have uh, these inline storage dams that basically inflate and deflate, and those are currently being run by operators um, in a control room. And so effectively what we wanted to say is, you know, there's this massive opportunity right now. We don't have to come in there and basically deploy sensors. In a lot of cases we do because they don't exist. But in a system that's already so sensor rich, you have hundreds of sensors measuring flow and water level and, and all sorts of other stuff. Um, and you have many control points that are already there that can already be actuated at the push of a button. Could we kind of look at it as a team and say, is there a way to sort of re- purpose this or re, re kind of reprogram it to do something different on any given storm. Um, so that's what we set out to do. So not even a year ago in November um, of last year, Great Lakes Water Authority made a, an investment of about $130,000 to the University of Michigan for what at the time was fundamental research. And the idea was, could we take these things that we've learned at the scale of you know 10 square miles and basically take all the sensors and actuators from the Great Lakes Water Authority and basically reprogram them to achieve the following. This was, the, this was one of the goals. Um, um, no new construction, just use what you have. All the pumps and valves and gates and weirs, use what you have and the sensors. Maximize the existing system storage in the system, so make more out of it. Reduce CSOs um, and equalize flows going to the treatment plant. So don't just shove all the flows going down in the treatment plant, try to sort of equalize them and, and buffer them out. Um, again, for, for 130K. Uh, so let's see what we could do. So. The current workflow in the Great Lakes Water Authority is like this. They have these hundreds of sensors that are streaming data, and these go straight to your typical sort of SCADA, SCADA database. So you shove that sensor data into a server, and that server is basically sending it to a display where an operator is just looking at the raw feeds oftentimes, right? So just like, here's all your data and look at it. So they just pick the ones they like, and they kind of look at it. They're not looking at hundreds of them at a time, right? I can kind of guarantee you that. And so um, essentially what they do with that then is they make their best you know, decision 
decision as to what to turn on at any given point. And oftentimes they make really good decisions because they have an intuition for the system that's based upon like many years of, of operating it in real time. And so the opportunity that we kind of discovered was here, was this in between. Could we intercept this data that's going to them directly from their servers and put something in between? Right? Could we go from hundreds of sensors and all these actuators to some sort of analytics engine that would basically convert stuff? And, and that's kind of what we did. We sort of said, okay, well, step one is let's take all of this data. And as you know, sensor data is not that pretty when you first look at it. You've got to clean it up. So that's what we did. We're going to QAQC it. Then we're going to shove it to something that does the smart thing, whatever that is. Again, using air quotes here, um, which in this case is a control engine. It's the thing that's going to try to tell you when you should turn stuff on and off. Um, and then we're going to actually put that onto a decision dashboard to the operator so they don't have to look at hundreds of sensor feeds, they only have to look at the information that's relevant. And so that was our sort of submission to the competition. It was the proposal that we originally wrote to GLWA, but it's also what we submitted to the Smart Water Challenge. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll sort of take you step by step through each one of them. So the, the, the first one was, let's clean up the data. So um, any of you who've worked with real sensor data before, or meter data, or whatever you want to call it, know that it's not nice, right? Oftentimes it's noisy and it's got these spikes, and oftentimes people will say stuff like, well, I don't trust it, right? Well, I wouldn't trust it either if it looked like the thing on top. So what we did is we basically took all this data and put it through a bunch of algorithms that we wrote that clean it up. So you go from the one that's on top, that's the red one, that's kind of the noisy data and looks like it doesn't have a lot of information, to something that you can use in real time that's actually giving you the water levels of the flows, right? Because if we're going to do real-time control, we can't pre, you know, post-process the data hours later. We got to do this on the fly, and that's kind of what we're doing here. We're doing real-time QAQC on the data. Um, that's step one. Step two says. If you're going to control one of the largest collection systems in the world, you can't just make reactive decisions. You can't just turn stuff on and off now, right? You've got to anticipate what's happening, right? In some cases, a day ahead of time, an hour ahead of time, two hours, you know, depending on the time frame you're working at. So what we did is we basically f uh, built algorithms that take real-time weather forecast data and real-time rainfall data and put that into a real-time swim model, and this took quite some time to develop, but basically what it does is it gives you a distributed rainfall map across the whole entire city in real time to allow you to run your stormwater model in real time and project future outcomes of any kind of decisions you might make. So that I can say, hey, if I turn this valve on now, what's going to happen an hour from now? Because I might not want to do that, right? So, so that's what we have. So it's QAQC plus real-time forecasting into a forecasting engine. And then we take that and we say, well, how should you actually make decisions about uh, what you want to do in any given time? And so um, before we actually show you how the algorithm works, I'll kind of just give you a quick overview of like what the challenge is. So I'll give you sort of a toy example. Um, and this, could, this is very relevant. We're sitting here. You have some basins that you control. So these, these buckets right here are basically representing CSO basins, let's say. And down here, I have the treatment plant. And what I'll plot for you is basically over time what could happen in the treatment plant when you make certain decisions. And so here we see two tanks that which are just about filling up because it's raining a lot over here and maybe this one has capacity. Um, what will happen a lot of times is as your assets fill up, the natural inclination is get that water away from here because I might get a CSO here and here. So two CSO basins might just simultaneously release water, which basically causes a surge at the treatment plant or downstream CSOs, right? So that's one scenario, just basically reacting to things as they're occurring. Another one is, well, if I were to hold water here, now I can overflow, right? So we don't want that either. So how do we, how do we go around this point? And so what we did, and I'll spare you the math, this is like one math slide. We have a bunch of papers written on this, and if you're interested, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you ad nauseum about the math. But basically, you have to have a way to do this in an organized fashion. And the way to sort of, uh, sort of visualize this or feel this is that you have distributed assets, they're all stressed to some certain capacity at any given point in time. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to balance that. You're not going to just open up the valve and let everything go out. You're going to say, hey, this basin and this basin and this toy example uh, are, are, are about to overflow. Why don't we release just enough from each one to basically start reaching some sort of desired point down there? And so we got a bunch of fancy math that does that. But effectively, what it allows you to do is to release only enough water from each one to start reaching some downstream condition. And the condition here, in some cases, is the treatment plant says, hey, there's a really desired inflow that we like to see, so could you basically track that inflow from us? Could you give us a constant inflow to the treatment plan? Which is really kind of a strange thing to think about, right? Oftentimes rain comes and you just deal with it as it occurs, but with a kind of optimization engine like this, you have three things that are basically, you're, you're, you're balancing the stress in the system using real-time um, optimization. And so the current system doesn't have three assets, it has many, many more as we saw. So that's the, that's the sort of like the, 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 the intelligent component behind the system. And so what we do when we ingest the sensor data, we make these decisions, is we got to present it to the operator. And again, 
you don't want to present hundreds of sensor feeds. We have, you know, these, these systems, the way I like to think about it, are data rich. They have a ton of data, they have a ton of measurements, but they're not information rich. You actually got to take the information out of the data and present to the operator only the thing that they care about, right? And oftentimes it's not raw feeds, it's these predictions and these ideas that tell them what you should be turning on and off. And this is actually a demo of the dashboard of the website that we built for GLWA um, to accomplish this. And so what I'll show you now is some of the results that uh, that we got from this. So what I'll plot over here is the flow going to the treatment plant. Uh, this is so I'm plotting the whole entire system as we simulate it over time. So before you implement this real-time control system, so this is with the existing control strategies in place. What you see is it rains, there's a really big surcharge of water going to the treatment plant, and then it goes back down after a storm. In this case, you had 842 million gallons of CSOs in this particular scenario. Now when you apply these algorithms of real-time control, what you'll see is a buffering of flows going to the treatment plant. So there's still some surcharging, but we do reduce overall the flows, and we try to achieve that constant set point later on. The big impact, though, is in the CSO. So we went from 842 million gallons to 735. So it's 100 million gallons like, reduction in CSOs without any new construction. And why this is interesting is because this is a reactive. This is not with forecasting. So when we apply forecasting, you start getting slightly better results. So here's a, here's a storm that we picked right here again, water going to the treatment plant. And when you apply, in this case, you have 130 million gallons of CSOs. When you apply the control algorithm, what you see is it really tries to reduce the amount of peak flows that are going to the treatment plant. And it went from 100 million gallons of CSOs to almost 30, which is almost a reduction in the, in the CSOs that we had there. So on average, what we've seen is when you just take the existing data and you take the existing assets, uh, you can, on average, reduce 100 million gallons of CSOs just by re repurposing what you have, just by turning it on at different times, right? Um, and so here's the thing that we presented to WEF on Monday. Uh, we estimate 100 million gallon CSO reduction per storm, and of course this has to be evaluated over the coming years. And this is by GLWA's own estimates. They told us last week that if they had to build a 100 million gallon storage basin, it would cost them $500 million to build. Okay, so you know, they have over the next 10 years or 20 years a billion dollar capital improvement plan that they're going to put in place. And if they had to build a 100 million gallon storage basin, it would cost $500 million. And just by repurposing what's already there, uh, you know, for that $100,000 investment that they make, you can save that much. Um, so I'm not saying you're saving $500 million. All I'm saying is it's kind of a lot of, you know, it's kind of a lot of storage, right? So. Um, so we presented this to, um, to WEF, and I'm happy to report that the students who did this project this, uh, this week got the, the national competition. They won it. So that was, they won first place in this competition with this. And so, you know, WEF was, I think, particularly excited about the idea that, um, this was at WEF Tech, that, you know, there is this possibility. You know, a lot of people are talking about new construction, and that is important. Like, capital investments are extremely important. But there's this ability also to use what you have or to maybe plan ahead and think about how, how would future investments be part of the broader system. And so here you see a bunch of happy students. This also fulfills my life goal of holding the corner of a giant check. Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> take that off the bucket list. But, uh, but that's what we had here. So, you know, the question is, does it scale? I think it does scale, and it scales to one of the largest sewer systems, and we're obviously going to keep working with GLWA um, to continue doing that. And so Brandon is going to uh, sort of follow up with another question, is, does it scale even more? <laughs> okay. So one of the things that Bronco mentioned was having operators coordinate the assets throughout GLWA and that network. But what about if you have several operators who need to coordinate within each other? And so... Circling back to the Huron River and the work that we've done with the Huron River Watershed Council in coordination with like Oakland County, Macomb County, Wayne County, um, Washtenaw County. And the question really that we're trying to look at is, you know, is it possible to manage these flows and make them a lot more natural? And especially in the sense of like the presence of climate change. So to do so, how can you operate the dams all along the Huron River to achieve that? And what we're looking at here is the existing dam network. And then on top of that, there's a layer of USGS gauges. And those are collecting data. And those are like the gold standard, that Cadillac where we're getting a lot of data. And it's a, this wealth of information. However, you can see that there are some gaps throughout the reaches of this Huron River. And so one of the things that we've done is we've come back in with our sensors and started to fill in those data gaps to collect even more um, data and get better high resolution information about what's happening in the Huron River. And from that, we've also had another dashboard that we've been turning to the um, um, 
to the operators of the dams, and we get to see like in real time what's happening and throughout like all these different locations. And you can pull it up on your computer, pull it up on your phone. So some really nice little nifty things that you can have. And really it helps to, the cool thing is really just to start seeing what these trends look like over time and how we can help use that data and that information to achieve the goals um, for flow management. So some exa one example is trying to maintain a base flow at this red line here. And the idea is to not keep, allow the flow to dip below that. And so now we can show that if an operator opens a, a gate or a valve so far, this is what the result is, or if they close a gate to a certain extent. And on the flip side, we also want to ensure that the water level doesn't decrease too quickly. So there's an amount of time over which we want to have a drawdown. And so from here, we can, that's, these are just ways to identify what these events look like and to help operators learn like what are the results of these actions that are being taken and to make them even more accessible. And so, let's see. Okay, and then on top of that, we are now expanding into not only the Huron River, but the Clinton River. And what we're looking at here is all, these are all sensors and you can even see, where's the, where's the laser pointer on this? can't do this, it's fine. <laughs> you might see a Google AR too when this picture is all I'm trying to say. Um, and then, so what we're looking at here, these are all gonna go out into the Clinton River. This is like 50 sensor nodes that we're gonna start using and really just try to flesh out where the water is and where it's gonna go at any given time. And here's a map of how it's gonna be so compact and where, it's, where we're planning to put these things. And, and what's really interesting is now we're going to really start seeing like not only on the main branch but all like the, um, the branches that feed into the main branch as well and really see like for a large watershed that has to deal with very variable weather patterns, how does it respond and how can we start collecting data to gain more information about how we can better manage the water coming through the Clinton River. And so also to bring this back though, there's the Huron. And then in the middle, here's Detroit, and here's all that work going on in GLWA. So there's a really interesting thing that's happening right here in Michigan, right where we all are. And I think Bronco is going to, you know, bring it home to show you, like, how really cool this really is. Yeah, so the DNR, uh, we talked to the DNR about a year, not even a year ago, like six months ago, and they saw some of the work we're doing with the Huron River Watershed Council, and that's, you know, we know how to do the technology. At this point, it's become something that we can kind of do in-house, but the, the really hard part that we've seen is getting all the stakeholders together, like the reservoir operators, and getting them to coordinate, and that's where the Huron River Watershed Council and Rebecca um, and the council was just instrumental. It's getting everybody on the same page because then, you know, if you just give them the data, nothing promises they're actually going to change their behavior. But effectively, you know, that sort of flooded over to this watershed where we're going to work on now. So in fact, like this weekend, if you're driving around here, you might see University of Michigan students deploying sensors. Um, well, hopefully they'll be wearing their safety gear. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just a bunch of kids basically putting sensors on bridges and stuff like that. So we got our permits, so we're good to go now. Um, but effectively, the idea is to sort of scale out and sort of look at a regional um, water information system. That's been kind of our motivation is to say, well, okay, we take Southeast Michigan at this point and we're going to have a large part. We already have a large part. These are existing sensors. We're, by basically next summer, we're going to have a really large part instrumented. And I think it's going to be unprecedented in terms of resolution and scale for what kind of information this provides you. And I think this goes back to the comment that um, the commissioner made about knowing knowing if the things that you're implementing are actually working. Well, by measuring all of that, that's step one. And yes, our, our lab is like, we love real-time controls and all that stuff. That's down the road. You know, real-time controls is something that's really exciting and it can achieve all these things. But step one is to do these measurements to see how your system actually functions. And then if you're going to implement stuff in the future to measure if it's actually working. So there's really kind of an unprecedented opportunity right now to, to have outcome-based implementations. So not just put them in and hope that they work, but actually check to make sure that they're working and basically then you know, fix them if they're not. Um, and so 
this is already happening. This is like a real thing and it's gonna be a really large water information system. The, the map that we have in our lab is this. This is what we sort of use to push the students with, right? Is the idea that we really, you know, this could be pulled off at the, at the scale of the whole entire state, potentially even bigger. And not to say that our lab is gonna do that because we have limited um, staff and people who work just half time because they gotta take class. But um, this really is possible. The idea that you could have all the water tracked so you know exactly what's happening so you can basically make the kind of decisions that have the outcomes that you're looking for. So um, with that in mind, all, everything you saw today is available as an open source project on openstorm.org. I'd encourage you to come join it. It's a broader community that doesn't just include us, but other people we're trying to basically recruit into it. Um, and these are all the students that have helped us with, um, with our deployment. Um, and just real quick, I saw my wife in the audience. Today's my wedding anniversary. Hey, Lindsay. Lindsay's a real, Lindsay's a real engineer, and she got me this really sweet water bottle for our anniversary. <laughs> it's, it's, it's powder coated. Thanks, Lindsay. <laughs> um, so with that in mind, uh, Brandon and I will be happy to take questions. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So that's, that's the premise. Um, so the idea is that actually what you, what you do is exactly like you're explaining. You have like an outlet, you close it during the rain event, you hold that water, and then when the rest of the system flushes out later, then that's when you release. So you, oftentimes you can wait, you can, you can basically hold that water for 24 hours, 48 hours, and then effectively release it later. And that's, that's how you use it. And what you do also, and this is what our sites do, is they check the weather forecast. They actually have a real-time feed to weather underground, and it says, is it raining? And if it's about to rain, open up that valve so we have that extra storage when the, when the rain actually comes in, right? So, and it's just, it's automated. Yep. Uh, well, yeah, so the question is how does it scale to really large rain events and how does anything scale to really large rain events, right? Um, uh, we were talking yesterday about the August 11th uh, event, which was I believe in 2014. I mean, I think as engineers we know that we don't have, well, we don't design for the biggest events just because of money and just, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, what this allows you to do is push it just a little bit further. So we, we can only show this much you know, during, a, during, a, during one talk, but the papers that Brandon wrote actually show that you can take an existing system and if it can handle, let's say, a 10-year storm, it can now handle a 25-year storm. Um, I don't know if anything can handle a 400-year storm, but still, with this kind of thing in place, you can kind of handle that much more, and that's kind of the premise behind it. So it's not a, it's, this is definitely not a competition between like smart versus a, you know, a tr construction. It's just saying uh, green and gray infrastructure, that stuff is there, that we need that stuff, and this just is a layer you add on top of it. So it's not like one versus the other. It's a great question. Um, so gra <laughs> ground watering, soil moisture, it's definitely like something that we want to, like we will like keep to continue to keep measuring. And especially for infrastructure such as like rain gardens, that's another thing that we started to look into as well. And we're collaborating with a lot of other um, programs such as the, uh, yeah. So, so I mean, antecedent moisture, as you're pointing out, is really an important factor. And with our soil moisture, with our soil moisture sensors, you can see a different response. So, like, if the ground is already wet, you're obviously going to get a completely different response than if it's capable to, you know, take on more storage. And that might be particularly interesting in real time when you're controlling CSO basins and other things that might be the receiving um, components of that. So, it's really important. And actually, where it becomes really interesting is when you're trying to build a model. And for those of you who build stormwater models, 
you know that you can take two storms that look really similar and for some reason they give you a completely different response and it can drive you crazy when you're calibrating a storm water model. And oftentimes antecedent moisture is one of those explaining variables that says, hey, that was really important. Like, because it's either sheet runoff or it's going to infiltrate and like which one you get is important. And they're easy to add. So we're not adding them to the current install here, but you know, if you want to add them in the future, we can talk. <laughs> so. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, we're going to take a question right there and we'll get back to you. Yep, please. Yep. Yeah, so uh, are we looking at existing public sources of data that can help us with predictions? And we absolutely are. So we, we're, pulling, um, we're pulling NOAA data, our National Weather Service data, directly into our servers and, and trying to ingest that. Because they have pretty good weather forecasts. I mean, their stuff works well. Um, obviously, weather forecasts, as a lot of you know, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But that's a big challenge with this. And, and they do a good job at quantifying that uncertainty we feed it in. And there's all sorts of other cool models coming out right now, like the National Water Model. I'm not sure if you know it, but um, the Office of Water Research at the national level has built a continental scale water model for the United States, for the whole entire country. That's outputting data every 15 minutes. Like that, you should check that out. And we're pulling that in as well. Yeah, um, we, we kind of picked a couple for this morning just to show you these right now, but we are doing other, lots of other projects in the region. Like one of the big things we're doing is green infrastructure monitoring um, measurements. So when you install bioswales and rain gardens, how do you know if they're clogged, what's going on? You kind of track that. And, and one of the test beds is going to be in Detroit. Um, actually, I just finished writing a proposal that was funded that's all about kind of, well, if you're going to do that, like if we're going to, if Detroit's going to invest, I don't know how much it is, half a billion, a billion dollars in the green infrastructure, how are you going to deal with maintenance? So how are you going to know when you need to go out and check that stuff? And so um, we're, we partnered up with the Sierra Club, and we just kind of prototyped it this year in Ann Arbor, um, a workforce training program, and this is in the works, like just early stages, around the idea of uh, helping to educate smart water technicians. So imagine somebody who, who doesn't have to go to college that can go out there and deploy sensor nodes that can basically replace batteries and kind of have a techie job without the need for a bachelor's degree or PhD because, you know, like, I don't know, you're still out in the field. But, uh, but that's the kind of stuff we're looking at. So we're, we're kind of getting out of the lab a lot, and we obviously have to thank you for inviting us to events like this to, to allow us to do that. But one of them is, is also doing the education component. We're really, really heavily involved with that. And all of that is documented on that website. That's fine. <laughs> oh, don't show my desktop, man. I promise I'm organized. <laughs> it's fine. It's just like random, um, random images. Yeah. It's fine. Don't worry about it. I break things. Nice. You didn't go to school for that. <laughs> more questions? Cool. Well, thank you so much, folks. Yeah, thank you. Good job, man. That was great. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Jesus. Okay. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Michael Cook. Mike is uh, with Advanced Drainage Systems since 2014. He's a regional engineer for Northern Ohio. He has an extensive stormwater and wastewater background in consulting. And I actually met him at the Ohio Stormwater Conference where he was a speaker there. And he does uh, a lot of speaking engagements at conferences like this. So with that, Michael. Great. Thanks, Dan. Well, like Ann said, I'm from Ohio. Um, specifically, Cleveland, which is what you see in the picture there. And like Detroit, we, we see it all from summer to winter, right? That's from the same vantage point. Um, my background's in consulting. I uh, worked for a number of consultants uh, specific to Northeast Ohio over the years. And in recent years, since 2014, I've worked for Advanced Drainage Systems. If you've ever heard of ADS Pipe and our product line, um, I'm the regional engineer in Northern Ohio uh, for ADS. So it's kind of cool, you know, in my role with ADS, it gives me an opportunity to really see the industry from kind of more of a big picture perspective. I see so many more projects now uh, that I'm not the design engineer on, but I play a part, I'm, I play a role. Um, and I'm out in the field more than I ever dreamed of being um, as a consultant. So 
Um, in seeing all this, it, it gives me an opportunity to, you know, to talk about what I see, and, and I, I get engagements like this, which, uh, which is fun. So anyway, um, this presentation, um, Designing Green Infrastructure for Climate Resiliency. Uh, resiliency is a term you know, we're hearing a lot more of these days uh, because of our current climate situation. Um, this presentation is a little bit about climate, a little bit about data, um, and ideas, okay? You know, how do we improve our green infrastructure? Um, so let's get started. All right, what is this, uh, what is this painting depict? What time period is this from? Where is this? Um, Uh-oh. <laughs> Um, this is actually from the Middle Ages, okay, 1600s, and, and this specific painting was from Holland. And if you didn't know, during that time period, we were experiencing the Little Ice Age um, globally. And most of our written history, you know, that we know today comes from Europe. Um, so we know what they experienced during that time. And that was approximately, oh, 1400 to about 1850 was the Little Ice Age. But what's cool about this, and when I saw this online, uh, they had what they, they called frost fairs. So they actually had carnivals on the frozen rivers um, during these very severe winters. Um, so people would be selling things, magicians, games, ice skating. Uh, most famously, the, the River Thames that goes through London um, had a large number of these uh, during the Little Ice Age. So think about the Little Ice Age, 1400 to 1850, and let's go back a couple centuries, okay, before the Little Ice Age. Um, we were in a period called the Medieval Warming Period, okay, and that, at that time, you know, that was the Renaissance, okay? We, we experienced warmer temperatures during this period. And when you, when you go from this period to the Little Ice Age, we're talking about fluctuations on average of a couple degrees in temperature. But that makes a big difference overall in how many severe winter days you get, how many glorious summer days you get, and, uh, I mean, obviously greatly affects your life and well-being. But this was the Renaissance years, okay? Um, and we did a lot of cool things here, um, and most especially agriculture. You know, the beginning of agriculture, excess agriculture, um, and, and you know, we, we hear terms like peasants and serfs, right? But we also did a lot of great things um, from an architecture and engineering standpoint. Okay, this is the Milan Cathedral in Italy, just one of the great, great cathedrals in Europe. Um, that are still around today and utterly fascinating works of architecture and engineering. Um, so that's what we did during that time period. And just, and just to kind of sum this up, you know, in looking at our Earth's history, let's go back to uh, when the glaciers melted. When the Ice Age ended, that was about 11,500 years ago, uh, we started a new geologic time period called the Holocene. Okay, and we're still in the Holocene, and we call geologic, uh, you know, time intervals epochs. So we're in the Holocene epoch right now. And we go back in history, and this, you know, globally, this is still recent history, okay? Um, you know, the sub-Atlantic cold period, that was, that was a period of cold temperatures, okay? As the Roman Empire evolved, um, you know, we, we were in the Roman warm period, and about the fall of the Roman Empire, <clears throat> the Dark Ages began, and, and, and the Dark Ages was a period of colder temperatures on average. And again, I, you know, I spoke of the medieval warm period um, and the Little Ice Age. And our modern age has kind of grown out of that Little Ice Age, right? And we're still in it. Um, and now, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing even greater effects today, recent years. Um, which, which is interesting and obviously affects us as engineers. So, in terms of our current, cl current climate situation, just a personal story, you know, we experience these, these, these crazy events, and this was uh, this is a picture from my vacation this summer. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> I vacationed on Seneca Lake in the Finger Lakes. Uh, that's upstate New York. And in August, you know, they had what I guess we're, we're calling a freak storm event that's becoming all too common these days. So I was on an isolated stretch of road in a cabin right on the lake, okay? And um, we got about nine inches of rain overnight. And uh, I heard it. I mean, I was up most of the night. And, and when I woke up at 6 a.m., um, I looked out the window and, and could see water. Just a, a new river had formed and, and was flowing over the street and into the lake. And, um, and we were stranded. We were stranded. Um, a number of us were stranded. And the state of New York evacuated every vacationer out of there in that isolated area, including me and my family um, and some little kids. You know, so it, it, it was tough. This was, this was the night before. We were happy. <laughs> we, we kayaked that night. Took my daughter on a kayak for the first time. It was great. Um, and, and then this was the next morning. As, I mean, and this, 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 was, this was in the process of everything. All, the, all that first flush materials, you know, and, and this first flush included things like dishwashers, refrigerators, flotation devices. This doesn't capture it all, but that, that's as it was starting to, uh, to come into the lake. So that was the end of vacation. Oh, well. Um, so let's look at some real data, right? Um, so I'm from Cleveland, uh, GLI... GLISA, um, some of you locally may be more familiar with that organization, Great Lakes Institute of Sciences and Assessments. And it's a partnership between the University of Michigan and Michigan State, from what I understand from reading online. Um, they're funded by NOAA. But just some data from the Great Lakes region, you know, which includes obviously here in Detroit and Cleveland. Um, average temperatures up. Um, since, you know, 1900 on average, total precipitation's up. But the more recent years is, is what I find fascinating. You know, Great Lakes ice coverage is down 71%, you know, since 1973. I really see that. The community I live on is on the west side of Cleveland, and my community is right on the lake. And uh, I really see that. You know, there is just such less ice coverage now. And we're, we're on the more central basin in the Lake Erie where it's not as shallow as it is over here. Um, but you look at the heaviest 1% of precipitation events and it's increased by 37% in Ohio and Michigan um, from 1958 to 2012. So just looking at the map of the U.S. and, and who's affected most? You know, it's, it's everybody on the eastern half of the country that's affected most. And, and we're, all, we're all seeing that, we're all experiencing that. And this is even cooler. This is changes in the amount of precipitation falling in that heaviest 1%. So the changes in the amount, who's affected most? Well, the, the big dots depict who's affected most. And you look at those big dots, and it's almost like when I looked at this, I was like, man, that's the Rust Belt, you know? That's us. That's the Midwest. And uh, I just find it fascinating that us as a region um, are affected most by this. The Great Lakes region. Um, fascinating. I focused on Cleveland. Um, that's where I'm from, obviously. Um, but, the, you know, the number of heavy precipitation days, 22% of volume is up in the heaviest rain events, and 16% and in number. Um, and again, this is data from the 1950s and, and, and comparing it to data from the 1980s until now. So, knowing this, knowing this is happening in Rust Belt areas and West, what else is happening in the Midwest? We have large metro areas like Cleveland, Detroit, Milwaukee, and others. You know, we've been around for a long time here in the U.S., okay? We have old infrastructure. 
we have challenges that other areas of the country don't. And now we have a climate challenge. So another study takes a look at the social vulnerability of specific areas. And again, I focused on Cleveland, and I'm assuming the results are similar in Detroit. But you look at age, gender, household income, your race, um, your housing, your infrastructure, which includes your, your water infrastructure. Um, and where are we most vulnerable? Um, Cleveland and the very surrounding, what we term, the inner ring suburbs. The oldest suburbs there. The oldest infrastructure um, also, you know, has people that are older, their income's less, they may not have access to resources, um, and that's where we're most vulnerable from a social standpoint. Again, I would expect something similar in the greater Detroit area. And then you take a look at the environmental vulnerability of a specific area. And this is more from a hydraulic standpoint. That goes beyond infrastructure, but water quality, flood zones, erosion hazards, debris. I mean, again, the same areas that's vulnerable from a social standpoint is, again, vulnerable from an environmental standpoint, which, you know, is fascinating. So the message here is the challenge is in cities, in major metro areas. And this is kind of the future of us as a people. Everybody's moving back to the city, okay? We're, we're kind of seeing that movement everywhere. Not just here. We're kind of following a trend that's, that's been going on globally for a long time. So this is our challenge. And as engineers, as agencies, owners that live in these areas like we do, it's challenging, but it's extremely exciting at the same time because we get to incorporate a lot of new things, do some things first, and see how it works. Again, kind of like the, the speakers before me. Um, <clears throat> so what I have here is, um, this is when I give uh, hydraulics and hydrology presentations, you know, this is kind of what I consider Mother Nature's go-to BMP, a wetland, right? Got a lot of space to spread out. Um, a habitat develops out of it. And of course, there's water quality that comes out of that as well. Okay, that, that's Mother Nature's go-to BMP. We had one of those in Northwest Ohio, right, called the Great Black Swamp, which some of you, you know, may be familiar with. Um, you know, if, if we still had that, we probably wouldn't be having the phosphorus issues in Lake Erie uh, that we do now. Uh, but, of course, that was drained in the 1800s and at that time, you know, pr produced the most fertile land for farming in the country at that time. And, uh, and it, 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 it's, it's obviously a lost um, BMP, you know, so to speak. Same thing in Cleveland. Um, if anybody that's ever been to Cleveland, there's an area known as the Flats, and that's the mouth of the Cuyahoga River as it dumps into Lake Erie. It's a fun place to be. But... <clears throat> Before it was a fun place to be, it served an, an environmental purpose. And again, similar to the Black Swamp, it was swampy, it was mosquito infested, and if you read about everybody that lived there at the time, it wasn't a fun place to be. But it definitely served a hydraulic function and an environmental function. And by the 1930s, um, and this was a Works Progress Administration project back then, federally funded, you know, they this me meandering Cuyahoga River, um, there's steel bulkheads that pretty much keep that whole river in place that was put in at that time. So that river is a conduit for manufacturing and business, right? And uh, those steel bulkheads keep it that way. So its hydraulic and environmental functions have, have kind of gone by the wayside, and that's no longer a swampy, mosquito-infested area. It's an area for business. And Cleveland grew up out of that. So fast forward, we'll fast forward here, and, and now this is kind of the era we're living in now. And the era we're living in, in cities, because I want to focus on cities. Um, the green infrastructure movement, 
Okay, and this obviously right here is an example of bioretention. And wherever we have bioretention, it's typically surrounded by human infrastructure and human activity. Okay, and in this case, a parking lot. Um, and there's challenges, you know, and this is new. You know, every stormwater conference now, this is our focus. Um, and there's challenges along the way. So I see a lot of this in construction, okay? And I'm out on sites big and small. And the challenges we face in these cities, okay? Trash and abuse, obviously. I don't think I have to explain that. Um, invasive species is a big thing. And um, what's funny about green infrastructure is, you know, we're trying to do the right thing from an environmental standpoint and obviously a hydraulic standpoint. But a lot of times Mother Nature just doesn't care, right? They're just going to drop seeds wherever she wishes. And uh, they don't really, Mother Nature really doesn't care what we're doing at a small scale. Okay, we scar the land, we put in some permeable media and some nice plants. Oh, that's cool. That's going to be gone next year, by the way, if you don't keep up with that. Um, weather. We experience weather like this here in the Midwest, okay? And, and I don't have to explain that to anybody here. Um, and what comes along with that? Okay, snow, salt, debris, oil. Um, a lot of that activity affects our green, our green infrastructure. Let's jump to the bottom, installation integrity. One of the hardest things that green infrastructure, and specifically bioretention, have to overcome is... If that material was compacted during construction, okay, that is the hardest thing to overcome over time. Um, that's years before that can be overcome and roots um, can get through that challenge. But, you know, we see a lot of that, especially on projects that don't have the focus of a large regional watershed, okay? So I'm talking smaller scale projects. I, I see this all the time. Nobody's out there. Nobody's out there. The ADS guy may be out there, um, but there's not really proper inspection. We're seeing a lot of dry weather periods in the summer, okay? So when we talk about resiliency, the Latin root origin of the word resilient um, is, is termed, you know, how, how something bounces back from being stretched or abused, all right? And a dry weather period is obviously something like that. Um, we're going to abuse that, that green infrastructure, how do, how's it going to respond? And then finally, our budget, okay? The owner's budget, that can change over time. We know that, okay? So it may have a focus right now, uh, but if a city's budget changes, staff's laid off, any number of other variables, um, the budget's going to affect the design life of, of that green infrastructure. So. I've just kind of thrown out here all these challenges, climate, cities, Midwest, precipitation events, locating green infrastructure within these areas. It's amazing what, what we can accomplish um, at the end of the day through all these challenges. Uh, so just as an example, this is what I typically see. Um, and this is obviously an area of bioretention. And I always think, you know, when you start out, it looks like there's a bunch of like acupuncture points um, where they've planted various things. And uh, a local consultant at a conference this summer um, in Ohio said this, and I, I really, uh, it really resonated with me. Bioretention is an infant, okay? It's an infant. Both from the standpoint of when it's installed it's like a baby in the wild, right? And, and, and we just let it fend for itself. Um, but also as an industry, you know, we're still in our infants, infancy in, uh, in trying to figure this whole thing out. But it's alarming how quickly that can deteriorate if nobody's watching. Um, not just over, I'm not, I'm not talking six months, but even a year, two years, it's amazing what can happen. Um, it's amazing what can happen in a winter, right? Um, most of our green infrastructure is going to be located next to asphalt, okay? 
And, and, and this, is, this is our challenge. This is our challenge. And, you know, I, I took a photo. This was near my house. This was, this was right after the spring thaw, you know, so late March. And, uh, you know, kind of what's left behind after the snow plows have had a couple months of operation. Um, you know, you just dump a bunch of debris on the adjacent areas, okay? Um, obviously, that affects the soil, the soil's permeability, and obviously, you know, when you drive along a highway, you see different species of plants that grow up along the right-of-way as opposed to um, as, as you get more outward from the road. There was a study um, in Cleveland where they actually found that, you know, tires, truck tires, I'm assuming, you know, driving around the country, we found salt-tolerant species that have begun to grow up on the edge of roadways, which is kind of fascinating. So um, perhaps from coastal areas that seeds get stuck in the tires and um, they're transported to other areas of the country along the way. So an invasive species, perhaps, but it, it's actually just a species that's adapted to that local environment right off the edge of the roadway. Um, good and bad, it's, 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 it's an interesting thing that's occurring. So, I take a look at it like this. Um, and, I, you know, my background's engineering, right? But also, full disclosure, at home, I'm an avid vegetable gardener. Okay, and I have been for years. And also at home, you know, I'm trying to landscape um, in a more modern fashion. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so that's kind of my interest here with green infrastructure and especially bioretention, which we're talking about. But how do we ensure a climate resilient BMP from a volume capture standpoint, from a hydraulic conveyance standpoint, from a water quality standpoint? Also from your planting approach and, and a maintenance owner standpoint. But think about it, I would like as the industry to think about it as a design service life issue. And when I used to work on water and wastewater treatment plants, you know, we would spec out pumps, filters, and other pieces of equipment, pipes. All of those had a certain design service life associated with them. Can we apply that to green infrastructure? I think that's important if we want to think about it from a long-term standpoint. We have a lot of green infrastructure out there right now, but what's it going to look like in 20 years? That's up to us. That's up to us what it's going to look like. So there's a lot of new stuff out there. Um, and uh, the plant community approach is something I want to just kind of touch on. I, uh, I attended in Cleveland, there's a pollinator symposium they have every year that I attended and I was probably the only engineer there. Um, but I found it fascinating because there's a book um, and I brought it with me today and it's called Planting in a Post-Wild World uh, by a, a, a landscape architect. His name's Thomas Rayner. And I saw this guy speak in Cleveland. And what I like about this, what I like about this approach is, is I think it really applies to us. Okay, it, one, it's an acknowledgement that, you know what? Things are never gonna be as extremely pristine as they once were, especially in an urban area. Um, this book focuses on urban areas, which is nice. Um, and it, it's kind of an approach uh, that takes a lot of years, there's a lot of years of research, but personally, at home, I want maintenance-free landscape. I want a maintenance-free landscape, okay? I'm done with mulch. I'm done. I don't want to get that mulch delivered in my driveway every year. I hate that. So I'm in year three. I'm getting there. But it's, it's hard, okay? It's hard. What you plant changes every year, and you have to manage it. Manage it. And, uh, you know, Thomas really uh, takes a focus on bioretention as well. And he's a landscape architect tied into the industry. So that's why I really like this book. And um, I'm sitting in that corner over there. So if you want to check this out at any time, come on over. Um, I highly recommend it. And that's why I brought it. Um, but thinking of bioretention in terms of multi layers, okay, um, filling the space, 
filling the space is, is probably of anything um, the most important thing because if you don't fill that space, Mother Nature is going to fill it for you. And we see that, you know, with Phragmites, for example. I see it everywhere um, in these unmanaged bioretention areas. So, you know, specifically at home, the community next door to me, by year two of a stretch of bioretention in a parking lot, the city had just dumped mulch in the middle of it. Well, that's done. Um, my, the community I live in, year one, they planted it, new bioretention, they have a sign up. Year two, it's full of grass. I mean, grass just took over. And this summer was year three, and um, they got rid of the grass, and they planted some, oh, a little purple cone flower and some black-eyed Susans. Call it a day. All right? That's a common example of what's happening here. So as we design bioretention, green infrastructure, we need to think about it. We need to specify it from a long-term design service life standpoint if we want to succeed with this. Another thing um, that's mentioned in the book is um, you know, going beyond native plants, especially with our fluctuations in temperature. Um, you know, that we see, and you know, even polar vortex type stuff. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, both Cleveland and Detroit, we're in this zone six, right? But incorporating species from zone seven and zone five is important to having a more resilient landscape. And um, that's, that, you know, that's some of the stuff I'm trying to do at home. Again, it's, it's, it's a challenge and it takes a couple of years to really get it rolling. Um, but I mean, th this may look boring, but it's a bunch of grass, but actually, you know, flowers, seasonal flowers will grow up out of there throughout the year. But that space is filled, right? That's what we want. And we want to fill it in our own way to serve its purpose. So I, got, I just got a couple minutes left, and I just want to go through some examples. Um, you know, bioretention, you know, typically has a, a six-inch underdrain on it. And... A storm event comes, and you know if it's new, it's 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 just gonna pretty much flow out of there, right? Um, I wish I had a picture of bad bioretention, but our challenge in an urban area, right? No matter what happens up here, we see this, we know what's happening here. But what's happening underground? Okay, we have volume issues in urban areas. Okay. So that's where we can incorporate, from an engineering standpoint, um, assurances. Assurances from a design service life standpoint that we're gonna meet volume requirements, make this infrastructure resilient um, by incorporating things like open bottom chambers and pipe underneath the bioretention, okay? This is New York City, I pulled some of their specs They've been doing this for years. Maximizing volume in a small area um, is one of the keys to resiliency. Here's an example um, in a parking lot. And again, at the very bottom, no matter what happens up here, there's the design assurance that your volume is always captured down there 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road. This is the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District example. Um, this is an awesome looking gardens in a very poor urban area. Um, but it's underlaid by a lot of gravel and 48 inch diameter pipes. Again, the insurance, the assurance that that volume is going to be captured because who knows what's going to happen in that urban area over time. That's a picture of that. Um, <laughs> that underground infrastructure, but before, it looks great up top, it really does. Um, but that's what everybody does not see. Combining pervious pavement with chambers on this specific site has reduced all overflows from that site to the sewer. That site has not overflown, over, overflowed to the sewer since uh, 2013. Um, so that's about all the time I have. I just want to wrap it up with this. Um, you know, if any of you saw the super bloom in California two years ago, it was a desert area 
got a lot of water, and all of a sudden seeds from years ago bloomed. And the pictures are just incredible. But when I saw that, the first thing I thought about, that's a resilient landscape. That's Mother Nature really doing its thing. That could have all eroded away. But it didn't. I mean, the most beautiful thing came out of some freak storm events that California had. Um, That's it. Time for questions? Again, I'll have that book in the corner here if anybody wants to take a look at it. Thank you. Okay, so we've got, uh, what is that, a 15? 15-minute 15 15 break, and then we'll be back in here shortly. Thanks. So how many people in the room know Victoria Pebbles? How many? We got three? Okay, so only three people will realize that I'm not Victoria Pebbles. So, um, we, one thing we were talking about last night, and again this morning, is you know this is our sixth year, and we've never lost a speaker. We've never lost a speaker in six years. Well, Victoria contacted us this morning, and said, "I've got strep throat. I'm not going to be there." So uh, she sent her slides. So I have her slides, and uh, we're going to go. I'm going to carry on the best I can. These are projects I was involved in. So I do know some of the background information, and, and I'll try to do the best I can. Um, there's actually another Victoria in the audience. I thought about just having her do it, but, but that seemed a little unfair just to grab the next Victoria on our uh, attendees list and make her do the presentation. So we're, I want to talk to you about the uh, Great Lakes Green Infrastructure Champions Project. This project was funded by the Herb Family Foundation. Many of you know the Herb Family Foundation. They're uh, an incredible advocate for... Um, green infrastructure in the city, for healthy lifestyles, for arts, for equity. They, they uh, really do a lot of great work. They uh, frequently attend this uh, event. I don't think I saw anybody from the Earth Family Foundation here today. I might be wrong. So, Where is she? Uh, she's here somewhere. All right. I was going to have her stand up and wave. So if you see anybody from the Earth Family Foundation later, please let them know. I gave them a huge shout out at the beginning. So. And then the, uh, the Great Lakes Commission uh, conducted the work as the primary uh, of, of this Great Lakes Green Infrastructure Champions project. It's about a, a year and a half long pilot project. So what was the purpose of this project? Okay. So the purpose is, is right there. It's really trying to catalyze green infrastructure. And there's a couple keys here. So one was this idea of this mid-sized municipality, right? So there's a lot of work being done in, in Cleveland, in Chicago, in Milwaukee, in Detroit, right? Some of these these cities that either have consent decrees, or they have utility fees, or they have um, a lot of resources at their disposal. This project was, okay, what about smaller municipalities, mid-sized municipalities, that may not have the resources that these big organizations do? And so the Green Infrastructure Champions Program, it did several things. It allowed for people to apply for mini-grants. And uh, we had, I was on the review team for those grant funding applications. And we had a tremendous, um, tremendous number of mini grants that were submitted and great, great ideas. We couldn't fund them all, but we were able to carve out a half a dozen to fund, and I'll show that to you in a minute. We also then wanted to set up a mentoring network where we placed people, mentors with mentees, and the mentees were able to um, pick the brains of the mentors. And I'm going to explain that in a little bit. And then finally, the last piece is the policy analysis piece to look at barriers. Unfortunately, that last piece is probably one of the most interesting pieces, and it's the piece I know the least about. So I was involved in the first two bullets. I was not involved in the third bullet. And as you'll see on her last slide, she didn't have any details on that policy. I think that's where she was going to wing it. So here are the mini grants. So this was the, it had to have fewer than 500,000 people. It had to commit to being an emerging champion as part of the, uh, 
a part of the network. So we, and then they were being uh, benefited from a pioneer champion. So we had these different, uh, the Great Lakes Commission kind of set up the structure. It wasn't fully defined, but we tried to identify, okay, who would be a pioneer? Who was someone on the front end of this? Who's somebody who's gone through the trenches on this? And then we had this uh, emerging champions or people that are ready to kind of take the next step, okay? And they all had to remove barriers and build capacity. And it was up to them to decide what their barriers were and what capacity they needed. Okay, so it could have been policy, it could have been implementation, it could have been maintenance, it was whatever they felt they needed to move the needle in their community. Okay? And the last part then is they had to say, well, here's how we plan on having a lasting impact after the funding ends. Because these are small grants. You know, they were, these were $10,000, $15,000. I think the largest was $25,000 grant. So these were not huge amounts of money. Okay? So these were the uh, grants that were awarded. We awarded these uh, five. So the city of Dearborn had a sustainable lawns project that it was a 50-50 cost share program. So they wanted to uh, look at how people could have more sustainable landscapes like we heard from the last speaker. When we talked about how do you convert your lawn. So the city of Dearborn was uh, also in a CSO neighborhood and they were trying to kind of get rid of some of that artificial turf grass type things. The uh, Chagrin River Watershed in Ohio, improving green infrastructure policy and planning. So the Chagrin River Watershed was working with uh, Northeast Ohio Regional Water and Sewer District with several municipalities. Rainwater Rewards, Michigan City, Indiana. That was uh, taking, what they did on that one is the WEMIAC, West Michigan Environmental Action Council, has a, a rainwater calculator that looks at the benefits of putting green infrastructure and rainwater harvesting in your community. It's been programmed for West Michigan. They used the GIS database in Michigan City, Indiana, and updated the calculator so it would work for them. So this was a, a policy piece, and this was also education and outreach to businesses. So getting into some of the local business municipalities. So you obviously have Cleveland, which is huge, but this was working with some of the smaller communities on the outskirts about how they could do code audits and update their code to be a little bit more green. Actual LID installations, this is the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority. The, for those of you who are familiar with Ontario, uh, they have conservation authorities there, which are kind of regional areas that look at watershed management issues and then also education outreach. It would be a little bit like the Huron Clinton Metro Park Authority, but slightly different than that, but in that idea. And then this unique idea of a prairie treatment system installation. So Oshkosh, Wisconsin, uh, they didn't, it really wasn't a rain garden. It was more like a combination of prairies and underground wastewater treatment. So like kind of an in, kind of a, if, if anyone is familiar with underground treatment wetlands, it was that concept uh, planted with prairie plants on top. So these were the, the, the five mini grants that were awarded. So you can see Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Ontario, and Wisconsin. So we, it was part of that was geographic spread across the basin. <coughs> so I sip water when I have to read the slide before I present it. So mentoring network. So this is where we were connecting the uh, experienced green infrastructure practitioners uh, with people that needed our expertise. So and that was how much interest this was in this program, right? So uh, raise your hand if you represent it. Uh, there's a few of you in the audience. Raise your hand if you represent it either a mentor or a mentee on this list. Okay, so there's yeah, about five of us, six of us in the room. Okay, so, so you can see here, here are the mentees. These are the people, uh, all the five mini grants were on here, but then other people were on here as well. People that weren't awarded a grant, but still wanted to be part of this network, part of this organization. And then they were pied up, uh, paired up with these pioneer champions over here. And so sometimes the pioneer chants uh, were municipalities, right? So you got Southfield and Toledo. Sometimes they were um, consulting companies, Tetra Tech, ECT, Drummond Carpenter. Conservation authorities are up here quite a bit. Nonprofits are up here, FTH. So you can see that the champions took a, a, a lot of different flavors. Uh, probably the most unique one is Friends of the Rouge. So, which served as both a mentee and a mentor. So, anyone from Friends of the Rouge here today, right now? Oh, right in the front. <laughs> so, so Alan, uh, the, what we had with the Friends of the Rouge is they had some things that they thought they really needed to learn more about, but then they had experience on other things they wanted to share. So, they ended up on, on both sides of the equation. So, they're a bit unique in that regard. So, um, what time we got, Ann? Sorry. I'm like desperate that she's gonna show me the five minute thing. 
<laughs> All right, so, um, so the policy piece, this is the part, so literally, this is the only slide on the policy. And so, uh, as I mentioned on the three bullets, this is an incredibly important bullet, and it's one I just don't have a lot of information about at this time. Is there any chance, I know I'm grasping straws a little bit, any chance anybody worked with the GLC on the policy piece that's in the room? Nope. It was worth a shot. So I know they went and did a congressional briefing on September 5th. Uh, for those of you who don't know what the Great Lakes Commission are, it's a multinational and multi-provincial uh, commission that is chartered to kind of look at Great Lakes issues. So they are provided some funding by all the states they represent, but then they also do uh, projects such as this, which was funded by the Herb Family Foundation. So they did a congressional briefing on September 5th where they explained their findings of this. They uh, are doing the, what's coming up is they had a presentation to their commission on the 3rd and then they're giving a webinar on the 24th. So I do have this opportunity right here to say if you're interested in the policy piece, there's gonna be a webinar coming out on October 24th where you can hear a lot more about this particular slide. So I'm gonna go back briefly to the, this concept of the mentees and the mentors and spend a little more time explaining that. These groups were partnered for almost a year. And so what happened was, the, when you signed on for this, you signed on to do a monthly meeting. And that meeting could be in person or it could be virtual. And at that monthly meeting, basically the mentees posed questions to the mentors. The mentors either had that information at their disposal or went and got that information or pulled in those additional resources for the mentees. Um, for example, when I was mentoring Friends of the Rouge, they had recently received a 319 grant from the DQ to implement a variety of rain gardens around the watershed. And they didn't have, they felt, the kind of expertise necessary to properly and adequately size these rain gardens for performance. So we spent a lot of our time talking about the nuances of bioretention design and tweaking what their design looked like to meet both the goals of the uh, stakeholders as well as the DEQ permitting process as part of the 319 grant. So we spent a lot of time talking about that. When, we, when they started going into implementation this fall, then we uh, did a little bit of pivot and started talking more about some additional kind of green infrastructure projects they're looking at a, across the watershed. So that was one example of what they required or were interested in. I already mentioned the Sanitary District of Michigan City. That was very, um, very successful. WEMIAC went in and did the reprogramming of that. Uh, Berrien County Drain Office, they actually did two things there. They wanted to update the county codes and ordinances to uh, have, you know, be more friendly towards green stormwater. And they also put on a, a regional stormwater summit. Thank you. I was looking for that five minutes. So, so I'm just trying to give you a flavor of what some of these things, some of these things were. Um, Tetra Tech was assisting City of Huntington Woods to look at how they might do kind of grant funding for some of the uh, green infrastructural implementations that they're doing there. Uh, let's see if there's any others that were kind of interesting highlights that I haven't talked about. So I think the thing, the last thing I want to point out on this, if you guys hadn't connected the dots, is look at the cross representation of the basin, right? So here is, here is somebody from New York mentoring somebody from Grand Rapids, right? Toledo mentoring Flint. So New York mentoring Wisconsin. So you have this cross-pollination going on. A lot of the mentors are from Michigan and from Ontario. A lot of that is because the steering committee, this is where we're strongest, right? Great Lakes Commission is headquartered in Michigan, so we had a lot more resources at our, a lot more things at our disposal in, in Michigan and Ontario. So where's this going next? So I can tell you that this was an incredibly successful pilot. We had, um, as, I, as I showed, there's a lot of interest in, in this mentoring network and increasing and growing this. So there's gonna be a new RFP coming up that, um, for new mini grants. Uh, the, there's gonna be a focus of those mini grants. They're gonna prioritize ordinance and code reviews, prioritize training and development of procedures, looking for sustainable funding, and then also community-specific GI toolkit development. Basically, these are four barriers that were identified both through some work that um, I did that you're gonna hear about this afternoon, as well as barriers that the Great Lakes Commission identified through their policy analysis. So we wanna do target mini grants in that part of it. We're gonna be looking at having a series of regional workshops, 
And then also, while this last round of grants really focused on those mid-sized communities, now we really want to try to get into smaller and or disadvantaged communities. So starting to push the needle even farther down in, in these communities that can need that help. And that's the uh, Great Lakes Champions Network. So we have two minutes left for questions, and I'll do my best to answer them. I thought Jim had a question, but he's just adjusting his glasses. So any questions at all? There's a shot I could answer it. I mean, I, I know a little bit about this stuff. So. What? Yeah. So. All right. Well, please uh, make sure you guys stick around. I've got some other things I want to talk about this afternoon as well. So looking forward to the afternoon. <laughs> Do I, am I introducing Greg or are you going to introduce Greg? All right. So Jim's going to introduce Greg. So our next uh, speaker today is uh, Greg Kozvinski with OHM Advisors. He's a senior project manager th there. I like to call Greg Mr. Stormwater because it seems like everything, you know, whenever there's something stormwater going on, obviously Greg's there. So Greg has been a uh, uh, stormwater consultant for WRC for some time now. Uh, specifically, he's, he's worked um, he was instrumental in the, in the work we've done on the stormwater utility bill. Uh, in addition, we've been working with him extensively on our uh, new stormwater standards. We worked for some time working with the DEQ, Marty and Christy. We had uh, great meetings working with them to come up with that standard. And, and most recently, um, we've been engaging in a um, regional stormwater committee uh, group to try to get consensus within the region and uh, Greg has been involved with that as well so uh, we feel that it's very important to, to get the region to buy into similar standards obviously to uh, having different standards is, is really really challenging for developers and engineers and we've heard that extensively so with that um, Greg is going to talk about uh, that group's efforts and Thank Good you, luck. Jim. Yeah. All right. So, Don, I'm feeling a scratchy throat coming on. You wouldn't mind <laughs> filling in for me, too. You're on a roll. <laughs> you could probably cover this as well, because Don was involved in this process. He's been involved with this group. Um, so this, uh, this effort, um, as, as Jim said, the uh, Oakland County had a year and a half ago in, in that time frame, um, an approvable set of stormwater standards uh, for uh, approvable in terms of the DEQ. Now, what happened after that point is some of the other counties got on board and said, well, let's really, let's talk this through. Let's, let's have some standards, uh, stormwater standards that are consistent across Southeast Michigan. So um, the group took a step back and we're, we're kind of deconstructing and reconstructing the rules. So um, if you could imagine what it's like with 20 cooks in the kitchen, that's what we have now. We have a lot of key, some of the key stormwater experts throughout the state. So, you know, are we going to use brown sugar or white sugar? We're going to, how much salt are we going to use? Butter or margarine? Um, well, actually, I'm not going to kid. We'd never use margarine, would we? No. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's not been an easy process because everyone's an expert, right? Everyone brings a lot to the table and a lot of great ideas and a lot of excellent experiences from, um, I guess the next slide discusses where, you know, who we're working with. So we've got, we've got Livingston County, so you've got um, an area kind of on the fringe of the urban area, still a lot of undeveloped area, so they have different needs. Um, you have Macomb County, um, you know, well-established urbanized area, uh, Oakland County, and Wayne County. And now DWSD was involved not from the beginning. The reason they have an asterisk here is that they weren't you know, originally part of the formal group. However, they have been attending meetings and they're interested in the process. They're interested in hearing what we want to do because obviously what Wayne County do will affect them. What DWSD does will affect Wayne County. So they're an interested, um, an interested player as well. So one of the things that's really important to look at here, and I'm, it may be hard to read this map, but this is a, from the U.S. Census 2010. It's a map of urbanized areas in southeast Michigan. So you can see you've got, uh, you've got Wayne, Macomb, Oakland, and a portion of Livingston. It's only a portion of Livingston is in the urbanized area. 
But the key takeaway from this, this figure is that the majority of the three counties on the east side, Macomb, Oakland, and Wayne, is that it's mostly developed. There's not that much uh, undeveloped area. I mean, certainly northern Oakland County is, is largely undeveloped. But the stormwater rules, as they're developed, really have to pay attention to what's done in these areas as they redevelop. I mean, plus you have combined sewer areas. And so the, the stormwater rules are going to impact uh, frequent hydrology. So there's been a major focus on this group on redevelopment and, and how it's going to affect these, especially the, the three counties on the east and D DWSD as well. So what we want to do is we obviously want to address the MS4 permit guidelines, which are primarily focused on the first flush and channel protection. And that's what we've been spending a lot of time discussing because that's, that's going to drive the investment on new developments and redevelopments. We already have detention pond ordinances that require a fairly large footprint for flood control. Well, now we have to add more footprint for bioretention, pervious pavement, or whatever it is. It's, you know, it's going to cost money, and developers we know are going to react to that. So we're going to try to make it easy for everybody. Um, again, we want to bring together the key experts in Southeast Michigan. We have people around the table who have been working on stormwater policy for decades. We have, uh, we have consultants. Uh, we have educators. You know, Don, as I mentioned, Don Carpenter is involved as well. Um, we, we want a consistent approach. We know that we're not going to get every single standard exactly the same across the communities, but if we can agree on the key things, um, such as how are we handling first flush and how are we handling infiltration, those are the things that um, could potentially drive a developer from one county to the next. So if we can prevent that, that's a key thing. And again, tailor standards to meet Southeast Michigan needs. Um, Livingston is a bit of an outlier because they're not as developed, but as I mentioned, a lot of urban areas. And then discuss the practicality of rules. What's the, you know, we've, we've heard the term maxi maximum extent practicable, MEP. So what is that going to be and how are we going to define that? So our primary focus is on first flush channel protection, as I mentioned. That's the, that's the MS4 permit guidelines that the DEQ has set out. And, and also, we're, we're going to get into a little bit on flood control. Um, the counties are relatively similar, uh, at least in southeast Michigan, uh, for the 100-year storm, around 0.15 to 0.2 CFS per acre is pretty standard. We are looking at um, what to do with flood control for smaller redeveloping parcels to see if there's some flexibility there. Um, we're still in discussion on that, so I can't get into all the details, but we're looking at some interesting alternatives. We want them to be achievable. We don't want to, uh, we want to encourage redevelopment. We don't want to scare developers out. We don't need more, um, uh, we don't need more greenfield development, or at least we need to slow that as much as possible. Um, if, if any of you have heard me speak before, one of my key points is that um, Detroit Metro has the same population we've had 40 years ago, but we have over twice the infrastructure footprint, right? So this is important. Um, and I think I just made that point. We want to be consistent. Um, we need to address the flashiness in the major waterways, you know, whether it's the Clinton or the Huron or the Rouge. Certainly that, those rivers have, been, um, have seen a lot of degradation over the years due to urban development. We can reverse that, not overnight, but over the next several decades or generations. Um, the channel protection, we want to address the increase in runoff volume. Um, in the DEQ rules, uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with them, is the two-year, 24-hour storm. Don't increase runoff for that storm, right? So that works well for new development areas, right, where you have, you know, a meadow or, or row crops. But what if you have a redevelopment area? The, the strict interpretation of that rule is that if you change your Burger King into a McDonald's and you don't increase your impervious area, there's no infiltration requirement, right? You still have to control the two-year peak, but even that is, it's not going to change since you're not increasing impervious area. So the, the current rules have no explicit um, way to address redevelopment. And again, this is important, especially in these counties where you have the opportunity to reduce uh, runoff volumes over time, especially in combined sewer service areas. 
So we don't want to let redevelopment fall through the cracks. The rules are going to specifically address redevelopment in a way that's practical um, and in a way that we think will have a profoundly positive impact on, on the water bodies in our, or the watersheds in all of our counties. Also, the, as I mentioned before, the, the current rules, uh, the, the, the major component of asset of a stormwater management system is the detention pond. It takes up a lot of space. So can we, can we be creative with the rules to allow maybe a, a bit of a trade-off, right? We, we use a lot of footprint for flood control for the 100 year. Can we trade some of that off to focus on the, uh, the first flush um, and infiltration? Um, because when you start adding those on, all those on top of each other, it takes up a very large portion of the footprint. So we're, we're trying to balance environment and economics here. So one of the things that we are doing, especially when we're looking at infiltration, um, uh, in the context of redevelopment, and certainly that would extend into development as well, is what are other what's some of the guidance uh, that we're seeing from EPA. So the, the EPA publishes a... Um, a list of stormwater standards, uh, what, what states are doing around the country in terms of addressing stormwater controls, whether it's first flush, water quality, uh, volume. And so 28 states have volume controls. That is, there are rules uh, with the state regulatory agencies that require some kind of volume control or infiltration. The, the, the most common is one inch. Uh, for volume control. Now it does vary. Michigan's a two-year, 24-hour, but again, that addresses new development primarily. Other states um, address just the one-inch the one storm, and that's one inch of rainfall. And in most cases, this is regardless of whether it's a new development or redevelopment. It's just take the one inch, manage it, infiltrate it, evaporate it, or, or filter it in some other way. Um, Fifteen of the 28 states reference volume control standard between 0.8 and 1.2 inches. So that seems to be the most commonly used. Um, certainly there are some states, obviously Michigan, Pennsylvania, and others that go above or below that range of 0.8 to 1.2. But regardless, the most common theme seems to be this desire to reduce runoff volume by 80 to 90 percent. And typically when you run the numbers and look at that, it's about one inch uh, infiltrating one inch or managing one inch that allows you to achieve that range. So there is a huge potential with these, uh, with, with the new rules to address the volume of water um, that runs off into the storm sewer and, com and combined sewer system. These rules are intended for the separate stormwater systems, but there is an opportunity um, within the combined sewer systems, DWSD, you know, GWK, to, uh, to significantly reduce flow. About one-third to one-quarter of the population of Metro Detroit lives in areas that are served by combined sewers. So that first half inch to inch of rain ends up at that treatment plant. And that's a really expensive to treat that. Not to mention the fact that as the population grows, the plant may have to expand. By reducing flows through wet weather, you could extend the life of that treatment plant, not having, you know, delaying the expansion of it even further. And given the cost of wastewater treatment, this could have a you know, very positive economic impact. So this is, um, this is going to be something, the next speaker, um, J.B. Hines, who I'll be introducing in a few minutes, we're going to be working um, together with uh, the George W. Kuhn Drainage District to look at rules, uh, stormwater standards for the 12 towns area, the combined sewer areas. And we're hoping that there might be a pretty good match between what Oakland County is doing with the stormwater rules, we can adopt those if they address specifically the uh, more frequent hydrology. So the current DEQ permit guidance is for the two-year, 24-hour volume. Again, that's pre versus post, as I mentioned before. Um, there's a, uh, some redevelopments may fall through the cracks a little bit on that, especially if there's no increase in impervious surface. So we're looking to address that. Um, we do want to look at rate control versus volume control because the DEQ requirements um, not only look at the volume for the two-year storm, but also the peak flow. So we'll, we're looking at that. We're actually in the process of modeling example site developments to see what the proposed rules might mean for a typical new development and redevelopment in different parts of the, the four counties. 
Um, and one of the questions we're asking ourselves, is it possible to have a single volume control standard for development and redevelopment? And that's what we're looking at right now. Um, and that's a conversation that we'll be having with ourselves. The reason we can't go through all the details of what those numbers are is the, the four counties are looking to, um, to share with the DEQ what our recommendations are within the next month or two. So we, um, we can't discuss that yet today, but we're excited about it. I think we've got a great, a great set of standards that are, that are being cooked right now with, with no margarine, I might add. Um, so maximum extent practicable. These standards were actually discussed two years ago when we were looking at the approvable Oakland County standards, right? And so this isn't necessarily exactly where the group is gonna land, but a couple of key points here is that we're looking to um, require infiltration on sites that have existing soil infiltration capacities of 0.24 inches per hour or more. I think that was approved in the, the Grand Rapids area as part of their permit as well. The other thing, and this is important, is allowing under drains when the soils are marginal. When you get below 0.5 inches per hour, the under drain is a friend. Engineers love under drains because it's a factor of safety. It allows the BMPs to dewater. And you still get your filtration. You can still encourage some infiltration. But the, uh, uh, the under drains, we have been, um, we've been pushing that idea because it brings more sites into the universe of infiltration or filtration. Makes it easier. Um, so that's why the under drains are going to be important. And just as an example, I, actually, I think I showed this slide a couple years ago as a kind of making a point. Um, Oakland County is different than the other surrounding counties. And this is a soils map of Oakland County. The key is that 56% 50 per, of the land area has A and B soils. So yes, infiltration is possible. Even type C soils, a fairly wide range of these soils you can infiltrate. And that 0.24 inches per hour generally is within the range of C soil. So it's gonna be possible to make an impact here. Now, I do know that Macomb and Wayne have less desirable soils in general, but there are plenty of areas where the soils are are pretty decent. How many minutes do I have left? Okay, I haven't seen the five yet, but I haven't been looking over there. Um, flood control, um, this is, now the DEQ is not, um, flood control is not on their radar with the DEQ permit, right? They're, they're interested in the first flush to your 24 hour volume control. Um, the standard of 0.15 to 0.2 CFS per acre, for anybody who's worked on small redeveloping sites, in Southeast Michigan, you, you realize that it requires a lot of volume, right? And it has, um, it has scared away developers in the past to go Greenfield or to go to other counties where it's easier, right? Um, this is a pretty common standard throughout Southeast Michigan. However, what, the, what we're kind of realizing as a group is maybe there is a, a flexibility that we can provide for smaller developed sites. Um, you know, for instance, a five acre site today discharges for a 100-year storm somewhere between 30 and 35 CFS, right? Um, 0.15 CFS per acre brings you down to 0.75 CFS. So maybe there's something in between that's still a lot lower than existing, that still makes it a lot easier on the existing drains, but then maybe provides a little extra footprint for uh, BMPs and low-impact development type designs. So again, we're looking at providing a realistic trade-off in investment um, still focusing on flood control, still making things better, but we are looking at some options for s redevelopment smaller sites on maybe seeing if there's a little flexibility with that range of uh, peak flow and CFS per acre. And this is just an example. Uh, this is some of the work that we're currently doing, looking at different, um, we're actually modeling different sites to see what impact these rules might have, where you may have larger pond in this one, but no, you know, no infiltration, a smaller pond with infiltration, just to see, you know, can we make it work without really increasing the, the overall footprint very much? Um, and we're excited that I think we can find a way, especially in some of the urban areas, to reduce runoff volume by 80 to 90 percent per year. And if that can happen in combined sewer areas, we're really in good shape. So this is an interesting website. Um, the Institute for Quality Communities, um, they have these aerial images that you can, you can swipe left and right to see what it looked like 
40, 50, 60 years ago and what it looks like today. So this is the city of Pittsburgh. And on the left is the 1953 aerial photography and on the right is 2014. So what the, the whole point of this is that you, you go onto maps like this and you see how communities have changed in the last 50, 60 years. Uh, Pittsburgh is a combined sewer community as are most on the east side of the United States. What you see is changes in land use and you see um, especially over the last 10 years as communities have been addressing combined sewers and runoff quality, runoff volume, you're seeing more of a greening, you're seeing a use of green space. And if we look at the potential over the next 20 or 30 years, um, getting the right rules set up, making development easy, will, should allow us to have that, that profound impact. So we can instead keep the population within the existing urban footprint and use it instead of pushing people further out and building more infrastructure. And again, a better balance between quantity, which is flood control, and quantity. And this is a picture of, this is from the same website, this is the city of Baltimore. And one of the things I wanted to point out here is, if you wait for it, you know, the, the, the conversion to green will come. And you can see here, this is the exact same spot, but you see a lot of new green open space open up um, through redevelopment over the years. And a lot can happen in 50 years. And although we'd like to, to see that we could solve this in the next five to 10, you know, we're looking over a much longer time frame. And if we can set up the right rules to utilize these green spaces in a way where we can actually infiltrate stormwater and reduce volumes to the treatment plant, um, reduce flashiness to our rivers and streams, we, we can do a great deal of good. Unfortunately, we just can't make it a five-year capital improvement plan. It's not that simple. It's not that clean. Um, and there is a spreadsheet tool that's being developed. We, we discussed it a couple years ago. The intent is to make all this easy. We don't expect the developers and their engineers to model this. It's, you know, it's using simple spreadsheet tools to verify the volume of your BMPs for infiltration. Thank you. And your detention pond volumes. And so that's pretty well established. We hope, I don't know if it'll be the same for each county, but we hope that we can maybe uh, make at least a frequent hydrology component uh, consistent. And of course, maintenance. Um, that's, the, that's the key issue here, is making sure that these things are maintained and they're working. Um, and there are going to be maintenance plans that will be required, and uh, several of the communities have a lot of good experience on working with landowners to make sure that stormwater BMPs are maintained. So we'll be taking the best of what we learned from all the counties and developing a good maintenance agreement for these BMPs. And then uh, as well as o &M agreements between the developer and the community. Sometimes this can be better done between the community and the developers instead of the counties and the developers. So in a lot of cases in Oakland County, the site plans are reviewed by the individual communities and not the county. So this is why this will be important. So I'm probably just about out of time. So I've got a few minutes for questions. I'm sorry I can't provide more details on what the actual numbers are, but we're close. It's a lively group this morning, not a lot of questions. <laughs> I didn't even have a plant in the audience. No questions from the DEQ? <laughs> yes? So the question is, how do we address uh, long-term performance monitoring to guarantee that the BMPs are, are working well? Um, the, you know, the, a lot of communities throughout the country have, have worked those into their maintenance agreements that require uh, regular inspections. It's, easier, it's actually easier for communities that have stormwater utilities because then they lose their credit, right? We don't have that yet in Michigan. So, that would be the, the ultimate way to handle it, is, is to have a utility. Like, you know, if you're in Detroit, you have a drainage fee. It's pretty significant, so you're going to want to maintain that. Um, but in other communities, not so much. So there has to be some other mechanism. Um, I would hope uh, that it would be the utility myself, but... Yes, sir. So 
So the, the question is how, how do we handle um, road projects and retaining and infiltrating stormwater under the, the, under the pavement within the right of way. So, I mean, that is done. I know the city of Ann Arbor has a Green Streets program. I don't know if Jen Lawson is here today. She would talk about it if she was here. I don't see her though. Um, and they do it pretty successfully in areas with sandy soils in Ann Arbor, they can do that and they do. Um, the, uh, the road commissions will have, likely have their own standards. They may not be similar. Wayne County does control, you know, they control what's going on with the roads and they do require road projects to, to, to take on stormwater quality and probably quantity too. Um, but it's, I mean, there's, there's plenty of a good a positive track record on using the road right of way to manage volume, whether it's behind the curb or in some cases the city of Ann Arbor has had some pretty good experience um, on infiltrating underneath the pavement. In some cases, up to the 100 year storm, believe it or not. Yes. Um, up to this point, the, the, there has been very little discussion on that, mainly because of the additional administrative effort. Um, the, one of the worries with fee and lieu is that it just allows people to just pay money and not do anything. So we really want to kind of encourage this and see it, unless you absolutely can't do it. And even then there will be, um, there'll be requirements for extended detention to provide water quality benefit. Um, when you get into fee and lieu, you have to have a, a mechanism set up for regional projects, and that's just not a place that we've gone to yet. That's a good question, though. Okay. I do. Thank you. All right, I have the pleasure of introducing Julie Beth Hines. Um, she's a principal at Birchline Planning, LLC specializing in consulting for municipal, state, and federal agencies on planning, uh, stormwater, wastewater management, water conservation, watershed protection, and regulatory strategies. She served for 13 years as community development director and stormwater utility manager in Vermont, and now works as a consultant in New England, the Great Lakes, and California. Uh, she's a research associate and professor in the Urban Studies and Planning Program at the University of California, San Diego. And she and her husband, Nick, love to fish and attempt to keep up with their four grown children and two dogs. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. And it's, I'm delighted to be back here. Um, and how many, are, are there any other AICP planner planners in here who are willing to admit to that? Oh, yeah. The few, the proud among the engineers. Um, the title of this is, since we're in Southeast Michigan, getting getting through green infrastructure barriers without crashing the car. Most of you who've sat, had the misfortune to sit through my talks before know I've always got a theme. Um, but we've all been working on green infrastructure. Um, we know that there are lots of barriers to its widespread use, maintenance, design, climate, etc. And um, I think probably all of us have been through the talks where we are instructed that green infrastructure is the way of the future if we could just get out of the way and stop putting curbs around things, right? It's that simple. So it's probably been what, almost 15 years that we've all been exhorted about the promise of distributed green infrastructure. And we know that it's a good excuse to put pictures of plants into PowerPoints. We know that it's a method of torturing DPW directors and their staff. Why aren't you doing green infrastructure? Why did you approve another pond? We know from some quarters who treat it as this magical cure-all for all ills, social, labor force, environmental, and everything else. If you just switched to green, all would be well, right? I tend, I, I'm hoping that we can agree that Green infrastructure for stormwater management fundamentally is 
When it's designed and operated effectively, it's a complement to our other st conventional stormwater systems. It's a complement to, for example, ponds with real-time control, underground detention, which is essential in a lot of our, our dense cities. But what we do get, when operated and designed well, is this very, very important complement that has a lot of other co-benefits that we don't get if we just rely on ponds, drains, and underground. So I will be talking generally, my, my general shtick today is about street, green streets, deep-rooted native plantings, not necessarily native, but deep-rooted appropriate plantings, parking lot buyer retention, permeable surfacing, green roofs, and uh, planter box kind of stuff. The other one that I think gets to what Greg was saying about redevelopment and about the development pattern in Southeast Michigan is both not paving too much in the first place, though that horse has left the barn in Southeast Michigan and in much of our urbanized areas in the United States. But where can we take out surfacing, impervious surfaces that we don't need? We have overpaved like crazy. And it's not that challenging to get the excavator in there and take out what we don't need. And that I would put forward as a green infrastructure approach and technique that we are underusing. So we all know stormwater management. We're all trying to reduce runoff volumes, correct? Especially in CSOs. Heads are nodding. That's a goal of stormwater management, right? We're all trying to improve water quality. Generally, we've gone past thinking that it's, it's okay just to deal with flood control. We do want to protect water quality, right? Okay, everybody's got that one. We're all trying to protect infrastructure and downstream properties, an important goal. Facilitating redevelopment. Um, is that a goal of stormwater management? I think what, what the four county working group has put forward that that is a very important goal not to put redevelopment, reuse of our sites and our communities at any disadvantage from the standpoint of stormwater management. We haven't always as, an, as, a, as a stormwater community articulated that goal. Um, planners have probably done a better job of saying that redevelopment is an important goal. So starting to think about facilitating through stormwater I think is important. Enhancing community quality of life besides not flooding, is that a goal of stormwater management? Should, should engineers have to think about that too? Well, maybe. What about increasing resilience? We heard a little bit about climate resilience and reducing urban heat island. Is that a goal of stormwater management? Is that also my job when I'm trying to design this thing? A lot of us would argue yes. There is some very impressive work with remote sensing coming largely out of Latin America, but also some out of the University of Vermont Spatial Analysis Lab on just how important it is to increase canopy and vegetative cover in cities, not only to increase our resilience to heat, but also because there appear to be some pretty profound impacts on precipitation patterns and that some of what's exacerbating these giant storms that are sitting on top of our cities is the city itself. Um, that's another three PhDs and a couple different PowerPoints. But it's, it becomes, as Greg was talking about the need for greening, we have some really compelling data showing us that yes, that's our job as stormwater managers too, to really try to put green back in and, and increase our resilience to heat and try to reduce some of the negative impact that we've had from our cities. So ponds and undergrounds do a great job of runoff volume reduction. They can be designed to do water quality. Sure, they're good at that. They definitely protect infrastructure, downstream properties. We've got some work to do. Ponds aren't necessarily the right thing in redevelopment because they suck up lots of land. That becomes commercially unhelpful. A lot of green infrastructure techniques can be built right into your building when we get into green roofs and harvesting and planter boxes and some of those systems. So they are pretty good at facilitating redevelopment. And the resilience, quality of life, recreation, tree canopy, that's where green infrastructure really starts to become the critical piece if we're going to make stormwater do more and meet more of these community goals. 
So the more objectives we believe we can meet through stormwater management, the more we've got to start learning to deal with green infrastructure and even re requiring it. A one way I like to think about green infrastructure when we're looking at it as part of stormwater management is a different approach to thinking about what landscape is and does. Planners and urban designers and architects have always been really good at the sort of design side. And they wear very aggressive glasses and talk about urban design principles and lollipop trees and stuff. But in designing, we've, we've missed a lot of opportunities and we've got to put that into that mentality as well. So lots of zoning ordinances will require that all areas not part of the landscape management plan must be covered with turf grass, must be sodded or seeded. So we've got conventional sod. Well, what if, yeah, you can still design with your pretty green lawn, but what if you used one of these new cool deep-rooted native plant sods that are out there. I got to see some in Superior, Wisconsin this summer. They're very cool. So what if we turned that turf grass lawn into an infiltrating device? There's a lot of work going on at University of Wisconsin right now on how do we create turf and turf products and soils underneath that can act as a stormwater BMP and you can still run around and play Frisbee on it. Parking garages. This is one thing that California is getting right. What if parking garages were required, and this would be by zoning or building code, to do something vertical with green? And you're seeing these really a lot of places on the West Coast. That is a green screen, is a, the proprietary device. What if our parking lot exteriors were helping to attenuate a little bit of rain and work on air quality and temperature as well? So really thinking landscape function and building function. We're making, green infrastructure is expensive. Yeah, okay, we're spending, our developers are spending lots and lots of money to commit arborside in compliance with code. <laughs> yes, uh, that happens to be a hydrofilter tree box. What if that investment plus what you would have been spending on underground chambers went to put some trees in that are A, more likely to survive, and B, designed and engineered to provide stormwater treatment? Um, I'm, I'm kind of thinking the investment on the right is doing a whole lot more for us, although this one's a great PowerPoint slide, so thank you, Dix in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. <laughs> I have been running around for, for like eight years now, maybe longer, I don't know, it's, it's all a blur, but I've been running around, I love to read and write zoning and municipal code. It's a sickness, but in doing that, we have barriers in our written adopted rules that prevent us from moving towards that sort of holistic landscape approach where the different pieces, parts of our landscape start to really work on not only stormwater management objectives, but those community benefits too. The typical ones are too much impervious surface. And again, much of that is already in place, and now it's our job to either disconnect it or try to take it out or reduce its impact. A lot of places, the zoning has no limitation on coverage. That is endemic in Southeast Michigan. I'm not sure why. A lot of other communities, especially Eastern Seaboard, have very strict limitations on impervious cover by site. We don't see that in some of our codes here. So you can pave to the edge. Too much ding-dang parking. Um, not allowing a shopping center with a movie theater and offices to share those parking spaces during the day, but instead adding them up so you've got an ocean of parking that's rarely occupied. Insisting that we have 10 by 20 parking spaces absolutely everywhere. Um, and I'll get to an example of requiring really large stacking lanes that drive throughs and things. Just all of it adds up to runoff volume and temperature that goes with that and all the gunk that's in that. Landscape standards is probably where I spend most of my time working with communities on how do we require site landscaping. You must have two trees for every linear foot of every 15 linear feet of frontage. Okay, fine. Can we take that two feet of, you know, that two tree standard and turn that into something that's beneficial, that functions as green infrastructure. We spend a lot of time working on making 
buyer retention systems count towards landscape requirements for a site so that developers don't have to spend the money twice. So if you do bioswales, those count as your required parking lot landscaping. You'd be amazed how many communities would require the stormwater treatment and then also tell the applicant, by the way, you also have to put in parking lot islands with trees. So that increases cost, decreases design flexibility. We spend a lot of time working on that. Also spend a lot of time on berms. Does water flow uphill? Right, berms, does water flow uphill onto landscape berms? No, it does not. It does not. And undoing the bermitis tremendous mentality that that's a good way to screen commercial properties um, is a real challenge. The other is evergreen hedges. A dense evergreen hedge, a minimum of six feet in height at planting, must be constructed along the perimeter of the property. Okay, goodbye any opportunity to do bioretention or stormwater trees. You could do trees and a fence, but no, there must be evergreens. So we spend a lot of time working on that. Public work standards, they're perfect, right? They came down on stone tablets. Cul-de-sac radii, paving systems, all of it um, is, is a deep challenge for us. We also have the challenge, Total Silence. Who knows what movie that is from? Coen Brothers, anyone? Total Silence, Fargo. Steve Buscemi's line to his partner. When we have total silence in a zoning code or a stormwater ordinance on green infrastructure and approaches, will you as the consulting engineer with the client who's watching your billable hours be real excited about going and designing something that's not described in the, in the stormwater ordinance? No, you will not. So setting the standards, describing to the design community, this is what we will look for and this is how we'll review it, is critically important. And finally, stormwater requirements. If, for example, you're my favorite village, not in Michigan, that requires design to a 7.1 inch design storm, green infrastructure is a little tough. Giant ponds are the only way you're gonna get a permit. So when we, we that, that's an extreme example, happens to be true, but we have to look at our stormwater standards and say, as, as the four county group is doing, and say, what are we going to do with water quality? How do you meet it? How do we set the standards so that we make it easier to get multi-benefit systems? We can put lots of words on the paper. The really crucial part, though, becomes habits. Um, aesthetics. If your planning commission loves berms, it's very hard to undo that as their go-to solution. We have a lot of technology mistrust issues. Permeable pavements, anyone? <clears throat> we have well-founded concerns about maintenance, which we've heard this morning. We also have silos of departments that absolutely, in this usually planning, kind of off on its own track, that are not coordinating their requirements and their goals with their stormwater colleagues, with their engineering colleagues. And finally, everyone understands ponds. We do what we know. Those are, these are the sort of people and practice barriers that take a different approach than just rewriting your code. So the words on the paper create the barriers. Here's a pop quiz. This is an example. This is from um, a well-developed city in southeast Wisconsin. That language tells you an applicant is required to submit for approval a stormwater basin landscape plan developed by a licensed landscape architect, etc. Okay, so you know exactly how to get approval for and how to design and landscape a basin by that code, right? Does that say anything about how to do bioretention? No, there's no guidance. That alone, if you go to the length of carefully describing how to do one thing and say nothing about another system, you're going to create, you have created a barrier, even if, as the city's told me before, we don't prohibit bioretention. Yeah, but you don't tell anybody what you're looking for. So that is an important barrier. What you don't describe is as important as what you do. And then we have the 
litany of, they're not excuses, they're reasons. Um, I'm trying to mollify the neighbors. Uh, the DPW deputy, oh, I'm, I'm not taking on a permeable pavement project because if it doesn't, if it clogs, council's going to have my hide. Um, speed of approvals. And this is an important one. DEQ regulator, this was in the Northeast. I am not approving this for that property. That property owners had six violations in 10 years. We get into a lot of issues of who is proposing to do green infrastructure? Is it a known capable operator who we can trust to maintain it? I've had, I've heard, I'll let Target do it, but not Lowe's. Um, this is an important issue because it, 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 there's some equal treatment issues there, but there's also valid concerns about do I have a property owner or manager who's going to be okay? So the process of writing zoning language to fix those codes. That's easy, at least for me. How many English majors were in here? No, I'm serious. Yes, okay. So you come up with the idea and then you go to her to put the words on the paper. But once you have it, if you have some knowledge and experience writing code language, which is usually planners or attorneys, be careful with the attorneys, but putting the words on the paper and getting this through to adopt is really the easiest part of overcoming barriers. Um, we have a rich, robust treasure trove of sample language and approaches that can go right into each municipality's code. Um, I do not believe in model ordinances. They are typically adopted, stuck in the back, and not utilized because it doesn't speak your municipality's language. I think you really have to go into your community's code and amend it rather than just trying to graft something in that's generic. They are all too different. But the principles are the same. You're adding, you take out the parking to be constructed of concrete or asphalt and you put in to be constructed of surfacing materials approved by the D Department of Public Works with sufficient strength and durability to accommodate anticipated levels and types of traffic. Okay, now the door is open for permeable surfacing. DPW keeps some control. There's a good first step. That's not a big challenge. Taking out berm and putting in shall be screened with any combination of a six foot high opaque, opaque fence and or vegetative screen. Okay, now I can do some stormwater trees or I can do some deep rooted plantings plus a fence instead of having to do a fence or a berm. This is not rocket science, but please get someone who knows how to write this stuff or who's preferably been on the stand for environmental court trials arguing over zoning for years and years. So bam, problem solved, like Emerald says. Stormwater ordinances. This is more challenging to put the right words down, but still very fixable. These are things we can work with. My biggest shtick to everybody is to define and describe what is meant by bioretention for purposes of your community. What is meant by permeable surfacing and how you will review it. Will you credit volume storage? What are you defining as an underdrain? Um, and just getting those definitions on paper into your ordinance is really, really important. What is a vegetated control measure? What is a vegetated swale? Think through what it means for your community and, and put the words in the ordinance. The example up at top is from Germantown, Wisconsin, where with working with our Wisconsin DNR and our engineer, we came up with a way to basically say, you gotta show a green infrastructure option. And if you can't do it, you gotta say why. This has been adopted, and fundamentally, it's sending a signal to consultants and applicants that this is what we'd like to see first. Generally, it's bioretention um, or permeable surfacing for those guys, and you need to show us why you can't if you can't. It has to be a Wisconsin PE to sign off on that. Totally changes the game when you are signaling in your ordinance that that's what you want to see first and there's a rational path to approval. Attitudes are much harder to change, of course, than words on the paper. 
this illustration is from a friend uh, in Wisconsin who will remain nameless but gave me permission to use it. This is an actual photo, not, but the photo was a DPW group giving a tour of their new rain garden. So what happens? The other thing is, so these guys are, these guys are grumpy. And I'm going to have to cruise through this because it's lunchtime. The other thing we've been doing in, in southeast Wisconsin is approve it to me. And we've gone through modeling sites using green infrastructure if they were redeveloped, using wind slam. I can give you all the gory details about it. And what we've done is taken code changes that were recommended to the municipalities and then done a hypothetical redevelopment of the site. And this site is actually about to be redeveloped using green infrastructure, throw it in wind slam and say, what would be the reduction if we substituted bioretention for conventional landscape, permeable surfacing for existing asphalt? And the reductions have been, the modeled reductions have been big. So this one, 57% volume reduction, 82 TSS. Another one, just doing landscape filter strips on that industrial site here. This doesn't like me. 41% runoff reduction just from repurposing some of that turf grass around the building. Parking, reduce the parking lot. This is going to shock you. The volume actually goes down. The runoff volume goes down. Who knew? Banking, do we need six drive through lanes anymore? No, but your codes probably still allow it. We modeled redeveloping that bank in Butler if we got rid of a couple of lanes. Big reductions. Um, just a little bit of math. This is just throwing an inch of rainfall at just the impervious surface if you just modernized your code on the size of parking spaces and the required parking ratio planners know what that is. Again, like Greg was talking about, these little bits of volume reduction add up over a watershed as our communities redevelop. So parking matters a lot. Sorry. Um, and I'll, I'll conclude with this one because I know we're running out of time, but this one's on the planners. We have had the impulse to require excess impervious surface for really irrational reasons. I can hear the discussion at the plan commission. Well, we can approve the car wash, but we don't want cars dripping in the road and creating wet or icy or slippery conditions. So we require 125 feet between exit door and right of way. And you can see on Google Earth the water from the cars. So never mind the excess volume coming off. I've never seen a standard like that before. That is a lot of excess pavement. Why do we need to prevent cars from dripping in the right of way when look at the volume, the excess volume that that creates during your typical rainstorm? Just saying, where are our priorities? Street and public work standards we can go through. Permeable surfacing, note I did not say porous asphalt is also important. Um, and we see huge reductions. We're doing a lot of green alleys in Wisconsin, big reductions from those. It takes different maintenance approaches. I think we all know that. I want to put the National Green Infrastructure Certification Partnership out there for everybody that is underway in Washington, D.C. and Milwaukee, um, doing job training and certification. I would talk about traveling crud, but we'll save that for another presentation. So go forth and reduce barriers, but uh, don't crash into your BMPs. Everybody wants food. <laughs> okay, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, lunch will be served out where you uh, came into registration. Uh, a couple of things in your packet. Back here at 1220 is uh, Chuck Hersey, and he's going to be talking about some uh, house bills and utility bills. Uh, there's also a self-guided tour. You've got a map in your packet that you can take. Of course, there's always net networking opportunities. And then after lunch at 1 o'clock, we'll be back here uh, in the main auditorium. It's a split session between here and the gallery, which is where you uh, came into registration. Another break at 2.15, and then we're going to uh, kind of w uh, wind things up at 2.30.
ideas or you know these logistical issues we really want to hear about. So um, Ashley Johnson from my office is collecting that information, and um, if you want to find out more about that, it'll eventually be up on our website. But I just want to let everyone know that it's something we're looking at, something we've done a lot of research for, and uh, we're taking steps to move forward in, in that effort. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, obviously, it's going to be violations of the Safe Drinking Water Act if you're not in compliance with the rules. So um, whatever the penalty provisions under that are, you would think at some point you're going to need to work through the asset management plan process. It's the only way that it's going to work. But the rule um, prohibits that. It's going to prohibit that in a lot of instances for a lot of communities. So I'm not sure at this point. So the poster child example <clears throat> for this is the city of Detroit. This is on, isn't it? Is this city of Detroit. Um, if you're familiar with the bankruptcy agreement and, and the formation of the Great Lakes Water Authority, the agreement is, and I, I'm not going to get the number exact, but somewhere in 50 or 60 million dollars a year uh, goes to to Detroit, not for the general fund, not to support police and fire, but to to, to support investments in upgrading the water and sewer systems in the city as part of the lease agreement. So. Let's say the number is 60 million, because I think that's 55. There, so it was between 50 and 60. How about so? So, Detroit DWSD right now is estimating compliance will cost them with the lead rule alone will cost them 52 million dollars a year, and that will be for at least about 15 or 20 years. I mean, just figure it out. I mean, it's it's kind of it's kind of crazy. So let me. Let, let's have questions and comments. Let me just like step back and kind of give you sort of the, the lay, re, recap the lay of the land sort of on a sort of the policy logistical um, level for each of these issues. So the stormwater utility legislation is stuck uh, right now in the Senate. Um, we haven't been able to get out of committee. Hopefully there's going to be a push for that over the next couple of months. I would tell you that, it, that in order to get this passed, unlike what I said here a year or two ago, where we didn't need to necessarily engage a lot of people, that's exactly what we're probably going to need to do to get, get this uh, going. So if we smell the opportunity to get this out of committee, uh, we're going to seize upon it and then start contacting people to contact their, their senator and their house representative. It got derailed by the Grand Rapids Chamber. We had a committee hearing. It was all set to go. And the members of the committee got cold feet because the Grand Rapids Chamber was saying all kinds of, uh, I'll just call it goofy stuff that, uh, about this being a, nothing but a tax and spend a piece of legislation. Basement flooding liability it was voted out of House committee. We're trying to get it on the House floor. Uh, these things, uh, a piece of legislation like that that got through committee and is stalled can start to move fast if the tide changes a little bit perhaps after the election. And once again, if we're able to get that out of committee onto the floor, we're going to ask you to, to weigh in on that. The lead rule that Kelsey was just talking about, um, there's uh, the Great Lakes Water Authority and Oakland County and D D D DWSD are working together in what's called a common interest agreement discussing, you know, wh how are we going to, what are we going to do? You know, there's, everybody's working on compliance. There's a lot of people drilling down trying to uh, comply with the rule, and as Kelsey said, we're trying to find out what people's experiences are, when, what kinds of issues they're running into so that we're aware of them. We're, we're at some point hoping that we can either through a rule change or a piece of legislation get, get some of the program fixed. Let me make it clear that, uh, in, in case it isn't already, that, that consortium, and I haven't heard one community yet in all the meetings we've had on this say, I want to replace my lead lines. Everybody wants to get their lead lines out. We just want to do it in a reasonable manner over a reasonable time period and focused on the most important places first. And uh, that's not what we're doing right now. So the lead rule, there are sort of se several parallel paths that are being pursued. We're not sure which, if any of these, are going to get us into a better place. But once again, it's sort of like, you know, be the eyes and ears out there uh, and let us know what you're hearing. I would say this to you as you work at talking to your com community officials. I think what's important now is to explain 
Whenever you're talking about one topic, bring the other ones up. Uh, we tend to work on like an issue at a time. But the reason I started out with that bigger picture is I think, I think elected officials are going to try, have to try to get a sense of, in a sense, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in, in, uh, undiplomatic here, how crazy what's going on is. We have a new lead rule that basically is, we have all this emphasis being placed on asset management. We've got a new asset management council forums, uh, a new infrastructure commission forum that are going on with an emphasis on asset management. And we have a rule that basically, as a practical matter when it gets implemented for many communities, is going to trump all of the asset management program. Because the communities, to meet, to meet their lead line replacement rates, that's the first thing they have to do to try to stay in compliance with that rule, which means they're going to be ignoring a bunch of other things that need to be addressed and probably creating down the line some other public health problems, which may actually be worse. Um, so it, it, I think it's important that you start to communicate. You know, we got all these things going on, and they're, they're all pushing us in the wrong direction. We're trying to amp up our investment and to manage the systems to make sure that our communities are good places to live, that the region's is economically prosperous, that we have the kind of infrastructure in place that make people want to stay here and live here and, and not leave for someplace else, uh, and have this high quality water resources that we can recreate on. But our hands are being tied behind our back. We literally, you know, between, the, between these various issues, you're getting less and less opportunity to dial into the, the issues in your community that you need to dial in on based on, what, on your own local knowledge. So it's, it's, a, it's a real problem. I don't know if there's anything, uh, we could talk a little bit more about the Infrastructure Commission and, and um, Kerry Cox from the WRC is on the Water Asset Management Council. Um, that's good, Sue McCormick from GLWA is on that council. Um, Kathleen Lamaco from SEMCOG, I believe, is the vice chairman of the Infrastructure Commission. That's one of the audiences we, we want to com communicate these, these issues to. I think the best thing to do now with the time we have left is maybe there's so many different topics out there. You know, what's on your mind? Phil had, had a comment or a question. Or it could be something else that's not on the list that we may know something about, but fire away. Yes. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I mean, that's the. So, um, wouldn't it be better? Because now we're being punished again for it. Whoever joined the class action suit, we didn't. But because we said, well, we're going to be paying ourselves. You know, if we end up flat, and we're going to have to pay you know, this class action suit you know, against people who end up flat. Well, wouldn't something, you know, thinking outside the box? There's only one problem with what you said. It all makes too much sense. And, 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 I'm, and I'm not being facetious here. I, honestly, when you, you know, when you go to Lansing and you're working on these issues, you would think that what you just said, A, because it's true, and B, is because it makes so much sense that it just, gets, it just goes like this. Like, Kelsey and I keep telling people, where, where do you think these lawsuits are being paid for? Where do you think the money is coming from? In the lead rule, it gets, let's go from basement flooding to the lead rule. The lead rule states that the water service provider has to pay for the improvements on private property. That means taking the lead line out up to uh, 18 inches inside the house or whatever it is, getting on private property, disturbing landscaping. For something that they don't own, they have to do it as long as the property owner asks. I don't know about you, but I don't know many people who would have an eight or $10,000 or $15,000 bill and say, that's okay, I'll pay it. You don't have to pay it, right? 
and the imp the implication, and the only reason this isn't a huge issue in the media all day every day is, well, the the the, the utility is going to pay for it. They have to pay for it. You don't have to pay for it. Well, the utilities can only get their money by charging people rates, <laughs> and and the state and. Kelsey said this, and, and you know, we, this is, I'm going to repeat it. The state is saying that they expected, they expect the utilities to spread that cost over their entire rate base. Right. So everybody's got to pay. And, and, and this decision called Bolton and, and, and the, what governs fees, which are sewer rates, tells you you can't do that. So, so the, when you dive into it, it's sort of like, on the one hand, as the way we put it, let's see if I get this right. If you comply with the rule, you violate the Constitution because you're charging everybody for something. If you comply with the Constitution, you violate the rule because you're not paying for the improvements on private property. So it's not just the basement flooding liability where a lack of logic is predominating. That's why, as we've been saying, one plus one plus one equals a thousand. We're, we're, we're heading the wrong direction. Yes, I, I guess, are you, um, I'm not sure, let me say something on you if I'm off track from where you're headed. One of the problems, conundrums in dealing with Bolt and raising these issues is that people have all kinds of examples of where things have been done and I'm going to put it this way, we've gotten away with it. There are a lot of things that really don't comply with Bolt, but we've had to do them as a matter of practicality to move on. Right now with the lead rule, you, a, a, a partial replacement is illegal and, 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 and doing things without the, the uh, permission of the property owner is illegal. Well, there was a lot of rental properties, particularly in the older cities. If you don't think there's gonna be non-compliance on one side of that or the other, because people or some people are gonna make the decision, well, I, I don't wanna do a partial replacement, uh, so I'm gonna go ahead <laughs> you know, w without the permissions I'm supposed to get or, or some other side of that. So there's a lots of cases where we may have funded things which could have been questionable. The lay of the land today, Dan, is this. There's a law firm that has sued over, I think, 14 communities, and they're not going to stop. They're getting settlements everywhere. It's easy pickings to go into a rate structure that was set up many years ago and find a flaw in it related to both and to get a settlement. And there's no reason to believe they're going to stop. I, I, I just isn't. They've, they've had over $44 million in settlements. Why would they? And if you haven't been hit yet, you, you know, I mean, I'm not sure how they're deciding where to go, right? But it's obviously the places they think they're going to succeed uh, the most. And there's some, some of these cases are still outstanding. They haven't been, Dearborn is fighting it. Yeah. Oh. Right, You're the mayor? Yeah. Oh, God help, I'm moving out of that community. What? <laughs> Well, that, that is, that's a question, and, 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 and I understand the question, and Phil's asking the same question. I mean, we face that on a number of different fronts, right, related to environmental issues and other issues, like I'm, not, I'm just not going to do it. And, and I got to tell you that in some communities, that, that, that's going to be a decision they make. They're going to say, like, we can't, they're not going to go out and announce it, but they're going to say we're not going to be able to comply. Correct. And then, and then you don't have to get a vote of the people. That's right. You're under. That's right. I saw somebody over here. Sorry. Annette? I'm sorry, any thought to what?
Um, for those of you who couldn't hear Annette, she was basically asking, if I say this wrong, tell me, um, have we thought about changing tactics and maybe getting kind of a grassroots up approach and having the public more engaged in demanding a, a better system and better accountability and better, you know, and I would say that's never been, not been a part of it. Um, I, I would say this, let me, let me jump to the basic answer. My answer to your question would be, if we don't get through in this session, we're obviously gonna have to go back to the drawing board and see what we're gonna do. I think right now, we gotta try to work with what we have and see if we can get this bill through. If not, I think, I think there's gonna have to be more emphasis placed, I think you're spot on, in getting the, the, the groundswell up. Uh, that we want something better. But me, and again, this is, uh, you know, I work for these people. Um, for me, I think as we do that, what we need to have is a conversation. Maybe we should convene some kind of a big, you know, sort of workshop to discuss this, is I think the strategy has to be multifaceted, that we can't be talking about stormwater utility one day and basement flooding the next and lead the next, that the conversation has to be more holistic, that this grounds up thing that you're referring to and that is probably got to be more all of this stuff is wrong-headed we got to we got to you know it's not making sense we got to make it all fit together I don't know did you I was going to let you take it. Uh, to answer the first question, how was it done? I worked for 35 years for some guys, you know, and five years for you guys. I've never seen anything like this. They, they created a work group uh, a year ago, July. Uh, I was on a work group, went to the first meeting, and I thought, okay, we're going to you know, try to work this through like we do a lot of other things. And at the middle, somewhere in the middle of the meeting, they said, well, we're going to have rules adopted by the end of the year. How many people here have been involved in a simple rule writing process that took six months. Have you ever seen it? This is, this is one of the most complicated issues you could address. Aside from the environmental and public health issues, there are the logistical issues about trying to solve a problem that's related to things that are owned and operated by utilities, uh, where you're looking at water supply, you're looking at the conveyance system owned by a regional, you're, you're looking at the local system, and then you're looking at the lead pipe on private property, and then you're looking at fixtures uh, within homes and trying to new wrestle with all of those complexities and jam a rule through. And the reason we're asking you for these experiences is because what we're hearing, there's some things we could anticipate, other things like, oh yeah, you know, somebody's going, going what do they call them, pigtails, you know, you got, you got things where people are, very, various people are connected to um, the same lead line through a pigtail, but one person says, I don't want you to do anything, right? What do you do with that? So the rule got jammed through. And I don't think, you know, if anybody is here from the DQ, the, the, the governor's office clearly wanted this done. The way it got done was, you're gonna get a rule out, and you're gonna get it out before the end of the year, and that's the end of it, whatever that, whatever that rule says. So it wasn't a thoughtful, um, um, deliberative process, because it would have taken at least a couple of years to get there, but we would probably would have got to a much better place. Does that answer your question? I know it's. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot that. So, so several of us. I don't. I'm looking around the room. I'm not sure who else was at. If anybody here was at some of the meetings, we asked over and over again. We basically said that you can't do some of the things you're talking about, and they kept saying, "Well, we'll get to that later. We'll put it in the parking lot," and they and they never got to it. And um, I will tell you, how do I say this delicately? Is Pete still in the room? <laughs> um, asking the Attorney General for an opinion, just think, let me just say a few things and you think about the backdrop in your head. The backdrop in the head is Flint. The backdrop in, in, is the, all the uproar over Flint. The backdrop is people being prosecuted for criminal, criminal prosecution that work for the state. 
and then somebody's going to go ask the attorney general for an opinion about whether this rule, right? What you know? What do you think you're going to probably hear? So, so now we're going to have to. We're, we're basically this common interest agreement. We're looking at all these various options to see what our what um, what we're going to be able to do about it. Yeah, I wrote a three-page legal memo asking every legal question I could think of as to how this you know legally would be enforced and it's constitutional and we didn't get a response and that was it was submitted with the comments to the joint rules committee for the whole rule process making yeah. okay Good. I guess we're done thank you says it's on. So we're actually doing a great job staying on time today, which is uh, not always the case for these, these summits. So we're, we're doing well. So the next, this is a split session. So half, of, I'm not sure it's half the audience, but there is another track down the hallway by the registration desk that are updates on some of the nonprofit work. This particular track of three talks was put together to really look at Barriers and solutions to green infrastructure implementation. So to kind of maybe do a different dive or a deeper dive onto some of the stuff that Joy Beth Hines was talking about this morning. Uh, so this is the first of the three talks. This is work that was done by ECT, Lawrence Technological University, Drummond Carpenter, and University of Michigan. And it really was a multi-year, well, it's not yet a multi-year, but it's getting close to a multi-year project to really spend time talking to constituents and stakeholders about what are the barriers they see and what maybe we could do to address those barriers. So um, this project's gonna wrap up next year, early 2019. So right now we're still in some of the analysis phase. So we'll show you what we found and talk about maybe some of the preliminary possible implementation structures to that, okay? So as I mentioned before, this work was funded through the Michigan Sea Grant as part of their integrated assessment program. So that's kind of the obligatory slide that they have for, for that part of it. So what is the integrated assessment methodology? I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this, but I kinda wanna set the stage. So integrated assessments are things that are done to tackle what they call wicked problems. And these are problems that have policy implications, environmental uh, implications, scientific implications, things like hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico or algae blooms in Lake Erie. You know, these are social, environmental, and economic interests, right? So that's what integration assessments were set up for. And there's a, these are the four tasks. These four tasks align with the official methodology associated with integrated assessments. The big part with integrated assessments is a lot of community engagement, right? Online surveys, focus groups, talking to people. A lot of community engagement and identifying tools and tactics that can be implemented. They're not set up to collect a lot of data. They're not selected to do a lot of modeling, right? So you're not gonna see any swim modeling in here. The data that they do collect is that social data, right? So it's the survey data, the human uh, policy type data. So this was our core research question, right? Which is, okay, how do we get communities to begin widespread implementation of green infrastructure, right? We all believe that there are triple bottom line benefits, social, environmental, and economic benefits associated with green infrastructure. So why aren't we using it more? If we believe it's superior, quote unquote in you know, quotes, believe it's superior, why aren't we using it more? And that really comes down to these barriers, right? And so these are the things that, you know, that uh, Julie Beth Hines was talking about this morning. What are the barriers that exist and how can we start addressing some of those? So let's start with the focus groups. So the first thing we did is we hosted five statewide or regional meetings. These meetings were t undertaken in 2017. So over, some of them were about a year ago. One year ago today was the, the last one of these. They were between 30 and 90 minutes in length. It depended upon how much time they gave us. And we sat down and we explored three themes with the audiences. Familiarity with green infrastructure. What are your perceived barriers to green infrastructure? And what do you think the cost benefit ratio is of GI? We had uh, everyone complete a survey and then we had an open discussion. So we've got uh, a lot of rich data from these focus groups. So these are the focus groups that we went to. Uh, Michigan Municipal League, Michigan Association of Planners, Michigan Water Environment. So just kind of give you an orientation of what you're going to see in the next couple of slides, right? So that's elected officials and municipal staff, MML. We had just under 20 people participate in that focus group. We had two big tables. 
Michigan Associate of Planners that was up at uh, Mackinac last year. We had almost 70 people at that focus group. Michigan Water Environment Association, several of you in the room attended that focus group at the 2017 meeting. County Drain Commissioners in 2017 and then the uh, Mackinac Area Coordinating Council. That's actually a regional planning group. So this one here really is focusing on the west side of Michigan, but it, inc it incorporates people that would be in these other groups. Okay, they're not exactly mutually exclusive. So the color coding is important. So we have a ton of data, but in an effort to try to get through this in 20 minutes and just to kind of focus in on some key highlights, what I did was I said, okay, here is the familiarity themes, right? I have a high degree of fami familiarity. GI is prevalent. I have resources and I'm interested in using more. This was their level of agreement. And then this represents the mean, right? So instead of showing a giant histogram and all sorts of statistics you can't read, you're just kind of tracking it, right? And so everything's color coded and everything's in order, right? So you can kind of see, <laughs> other than the planners, everybody's strongly in agreement they want to use more green infrastructure. So, and I, you know, you can take that with a grain of salt. You could just say, well, the planners are already using a bunch, so they're not interested in using more, right? They're already promoting this. So, but you can kind of see everyone was really neutral about the resources. Like, yeah, we have some resources, but maybe not as much. Everyone's pretty neutral about how prevalent GI is. And then you get a little bit of a mix here, right? So the planners and the environmental specialists actually responded neutral to the question of high, of a high degree of familiarity. So it could be that they're a little more self-reflective, you know, in, in some of these things. Well, we're not sure, right? So that was familiarity, right? A lot of concern about maintenance and warranty, right? How long are you going to guarantee what you're putting in the ground is going to last for? Do I get a two-year warranty, a five-year warranty? When are you going to come back and solve this for me? Okay. How the heck do these changing regulations work? Okay. How do we reduce the risk? So all this kind of came up over and over again. Um, cost didn't rise to the top, believe it or not. And a lot of it had to do with, uh, so leadership as a driver, we just heard from Royal Oak, that came up a lot. Market barriers for small manufacturers came up a lot. Okay. How do the small guys get part of the, uh, engaged in this? Okay. So all these were the, the themes that came out of the interview. When we start talking to the focus groups, it narrowed down to kind of like these five things. This is really what came up, right? Tell me how your technology can address my problem, my concern. Tell me why I should believe it. How is it not going to cost me a ton of money? Please tell me that it's not a risk that I, you know, because if it's a huge risk, I got to be, you know, evaluate whether that risk is going to take. And then finally, is leadership going to move this as regulation is going to allow it? Those kind of came over and over and over again. So you're seeing a lot of themes today. A lot of different people are kind of telling the same story, right? So we've covered this before, you know, but this is the same, same story that we've heard from a lot of different avenues. Okay. So this is the charter, right? So the collaborative is a multi-sector binational network. That sounds really good, doesn't it? A multi-sector binational network. So... Share information, data, and advice about technology and approaches to stormwater management through networking partnerships and information exchange, okay? Obviously, I am a proponent of green infrastructure, but you don't see green infrastructure anywhere in this. This is a broader collaborative, okay? Those are the objectives. I'm not going to read them all to you because you can read faster than I can talk, but the objectives of the collaborative were set up to address the things that we were hearing from the constituents, Okay? Match technology, build confidence, promote triple bottom line, okay, and then maintenance inspection. Okay, we hear that a lot. Who's going to maintain it? Who's going to inspect it? Who's going to tell me five years ago it still works? Okay. There was a charter. All this stuff is available online. You can read our charter, the mission, the objectives, the operating principles, okay. There's our structure. I already talked about the two chairs of it. There's nine people on the leadership team. And then there's a general membership, right? So it's broad. We, anyone who wants to be a member can be a member. At this point in time, the collaborative is not set up as like a, a fee-based structure. It's, if you want to participate, you're more than happy to participate. Um, we just published an article in a, a magazine in, in Ontario. So an article in the, um, basically that went out to all the industry professionals in Ontario saying, hey, feel free to join up. There's a lot of, a lot of energy for this collaborative on the other side of the border. I probably as much if not more than on our side of the border. So that's our website. I told you I promised I'd keep it brief. 
Everything about the collaborative is on the website. So you've got the, there's a, uh, in, you can actually email it for more information if you'd like. You can join our membership. Um, you can participate. The, one of the things that's nice about the collaborative is it's set up such that if you've got an idea that you want to run with, and it's you know, at least somewhat vetted by the collaborative, you can run with it. It's a, this is a volunteer organization, as uh, I have to keep reminding, or Ann and I have to keep reminding everybody. This is a volunteer organization. It's not a high-funded organization. So at least we got a cool logo. Right. All right, so that was the, uh, my last time with Victoria's hat. So if there are any questions about the, how much time do we have before break? Five minutes? Five minutes. Right, we have five minutes over break. Is there any questions about the collaborative? Or Holly's still here, if you, if you got cut off ahead of time for Royal Oak. <laughs> Holly's like, what are you doing to me? So please. <laughs> I'm sorry, Holly. I shouldn't have done that to you. <laughs> Wait, now that the mayor's gone, Holly's going to tell you how it really is. We heard about the rain gardens. There's a lot of developments uh, being built in uh, Royal Oak uh, every single day. Uh, how much GIs are, do those have? Like the Mark Twain site, uh, the 13 Mile Rochester site? Sure. So, uh, so the question was, you know, we have a lot of development going on in Royal Oak commercially, and um, how much green infrastructure are we seeing there? And the answer is very little, because right now our ordinance says, this is how you do stormwater detention, gray. <laughs> that's, that's what we've defined. And then there's like one sentence that says, or you can do green infrastructure at the discretion of the city engineer and you kind of have to prove your case to him. So um, I believe there's a couple sites, I don't know them offhand, um, smaller commercial sites that have found a way to do that because there was no way to really do gray infrastructure based on the size of their site. Um, but currently it's not something that we force or something we even require for, um, for private developments. And also there was some discussion about communication between two different groups of people, I the name of the people, who had the standards and who had the knowledge and um, recently on Royal Oak, uh, they were, the people who lived on Campbell Road were made to pave their driveways, you know what I'm talking about, and the car pads. And now they're gonna be charged because <laughs> they're regular old concrete that it's, you know, impervious. Like it seemed like there was a, was there a communication gap or what the, uh, not, not exactly. The example you're referring to, um, Campbell Road is one of our major roads um, and with a lot of residences on it, and so it's really hard to back out of your driveway on this four-lane road. And so when we redid Campbell a few years ago, we gave residents the opportunity to install in the right-of-way a little pull-off, like parking spot almost, so that they had a place to kind of turn around before entering the road. Um, so it's city right away, and it was funded by the city, so residents haven't paid for that. Um, and because it's right of way, that's not included in the analysis of what's permeable and what's impermeable on somebody's property. So that won't factor into um, what they'll, their build, basically, for their utility. The driveway beyond the sidewalk, because that's private property, whereas sidewalk to the road is public property, and that's not evaluated. Thanks. Uh, we, uh, you mentioned the engineer's discretion. On the new ordinance, do you have triggers in there based on square footage or when you can go back? Let's say a, a small improvement, you can go back and require some kind of green infrastructure. Four bays, first flush, things like that. I get, I'm not quite sure what you mean. Like, go back if and. There, if there's an existing development and they're adding a small addition in the building or parking lot, yeah. okay. so they're disturbing the land. Yeah, so 6,100 square feet is our trigger for 6,100 square feet. So if you have that much being disturbed, um, or if you have that much plus property that you plan to disturb in the future, you need to accommodate for that with stormwater detention in some way. We would consider green infrastructure at this point, um, or gray infrastructure is, is kind of what's specified better in our ordinance. We don't have a new ordinance yet. We need a lot of work to get there. It's like baby steps right now. Thank you, Holly. Appreciate it. Any last uh, comment or question? Oops.
Thank you. All right, with that, we are at our break. Uh, we appreciate everyone's patience today, and we're doing a good job staying on time. So one more break, and then we got a couple great talks afterwards. Okay, we should probably get started now. Uh, we're going to introduce uh, the next session is the Erie Hack Innovation Challenge Overview. Overview. Our first speaker is Paul Reiser Jr. He's the Managing Director of Technology-Based Entrepreneur Entrepreneurs uh, Tech Town Detroit. Yes. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Appreciate it. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Ovation prior to start. You might want to hold off. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know how this is going to go. No, just kidding. Uh, I'm the managing director of tech-based entrepreneur programs at TechTown Detroit. I've uh, been there for four years uh, now, and so uh, I want to spend just a few minutes before I hand this over to Brian, just kind of talking about not only TechTown, a, a little intro of TechTown and our work, but also how and why um, TechTown was able to partner with the Erie Hack Challenge that you'll hear some details from Brian about. Um, but then also kind of the impact that we've seen it happen or have on TechTown, on the region, um, some of, some of the uh, surprise elements that we were able to kind of uncover and unpack with this Erie Hack Innovation Challenge. So um, for those who don't know, uh, TechTown Detroit is the city's uh, longest standing incubator and accelerator in Midtown Detroit. It's been around for about 17 years now. So. Um, I like to say sometimes even before entrepreneurship was uh, nearly as popular as it is now. Um, of course, it's on every campus. You can't go anywhere without hearing about entrepreneurship. Um, but TechTown um, focuses actually in, in three areas. And one is a, a physical space, a building we have that's about 130,000 square feet, about 160 tenants with uh, small, medium, and large companies, um, about 100 and 10, 115 of those 160 are startups. These are one to five size employees, a lot of them using shared workspace, um, consuming a lot of energy bars, the internet for free Wi-Fi, and a lot of coffee. But they're building small businesses and they're there either to just consume or use the space that we provide, and some of them are using the space and also taking advantage uh, of business services that we provide to some of the tenants. We also have Larger organizations such as Henry Ford and the National Institute of Health is there. Uh, Lyft, the ride sharing organization is in the building. Mercedes Benz Financial Services and many others. Some um, marketing firms, social media firms, law firms, you name it, are in the space and actually even a lot of students. Um, but they spend that time there. Some of those larger organizations are there not because they have to be, but because they want to be closer to innovation. They want to be closer to some of the greatest ideas that are coming out of this region. They want to be close to that enthusiasm. Um, we also do a ton of events there. We did 120 events, including events like Erie Hack and the information sessions that we'll talk about a little bit that led up to Erie Hack. But we open up that building intentionally to be a place where um, people from the public can take advantage of it, uh, participate in free seminars, free information sessions, hackathons, you name it. Um, we also, as in the slide, what a lot of people don't know about is that we also support small businesses in neighborhoods. So in about seven or eight neighborhoods across the city of Detroit, um, we work with um, what we call you know, retail-based businesses or lifestyle businesses. These are coffee shops, restaurants, small manufacturers, um, service providers, or independent consultants that are in neighborhoods. Um, throughout the city of Detroit. So it's actually two thirds of the businesses that we work with in a year are not tech businesses. So contrary to our name, we work with less tech businesses than we do non-tech businesses. So about 250 or 300 clients per year are your coffee shops, your restaurants, your retail shops, your small manufacturers and neighborhoods. And so we've been in that business now for about five or six years and are now starting to help cities like Lansing and Pontiac and also um, cities in Maine even who are calling us to say, hey, we realize we're not going to be the next Silicon Valley either, um, but we've got our own set of strengths and assets, and we can't forget about the people in neighborhoods who need 
amenities. They don't want to go two miles for a coffee, a cup of coffee. They rather go two blocks. So um, that's what the um, blocks program, and you see that that uh, logo in the middle, the small business support programs. And the business that I actually manage um, excitedly now for four years is the tech-based businesses. So these are your mobile apps, your medical devices, mobility solutions, ed tech, fintech, you name it, anything tech, even consumer products. And Brian and I actually met uh, probably late 16 or um, third quarter of 16. And Brian introduced this um, great idea of coming together and partnering with multiple other cities um, coming together as a region to explore and, and tap into uh, water innovation opportunities. And I'll tell you, in my first four years of being at TechTown, I probably could count on one hand the number of tech-based ideas that were driven and focused on solving issues around water. Of course, we had the Flint issue, and we've had infrastructure challenges, and we get a, you know, a lot of um, you know, sometimes more reactive um, to the negative issues that happen with respect to water um, and water quality and water issues in our region. But this was awesome and exciting to me because um, it was an experiment to see exactly maybe who could we extract? Were there a number of people who uh, were interested or working on water tech ideas that maybe we just weren't aware of? Um, secondly, um, we wanted to be proactive in how we addressed stormwater runoff, um, algae blooms, um, infrastructure issues, and all of these other kind of dynamics that are entering the uh, information technology and startup uh, world around artificial intelligence and sensors and analytics. And so how could we bring these things together? And it was just a fabulous opportunity to, like I said, and emphasize, this was an experiment. We had no idea if four startups or four founders were gonna show up or 40. We didn't know if two companies were gonna sponsor or, or kick in and, and say we, we, we like this idea or if it was gonna be 12. And so we started this experiment and Brian, I won't definitely steal the thunder of the presentation that, that you'll see from him, um, but, but we, we, we just had a blast and, and it exceeded actually all expectations. And to be able to partner with five other cities in this region all around Lake Erie Basin, and to really activate the Detroit community around water innovation and water potential and the, and the environmental issues and sustainability and leveraging sensors and technology, we probably got um, six, seven times the number of, of startups and innovators who participated in the Erie Hack Challenge than we anticipated. Um, I would be remiss to say and, and not give thanks to the Herb Family Foundation, who in 2016, 2017 supported the Detroit region's entrance into and partnership and ability to work with Erie Hack um, on a regional level. And so Detroit was really activated because of the support of the Herb Family Foundation. So I don't know if there's any representatives from Herb Fam Family Foundation. Thank you so very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think give them a round of applause. I think they deserve it. And so we're, we're super excited to have the opportunity now in 1819 to renew that and to take it to the next level, next level and to incorporate hopefully more students, more professionals, more innovators, um, more researchers, and even more corporate entities and corporate partners that we can get engaged in this very important work. So, um, like I said, without uh, going too far into detail, we've got a presentation. We even got a short video at the end that hopefully we have time for. I'll be hanging around to answer questions um, about the process, and we even got a, a presentation from our winning team um, from the Erie Hack Challenge. So, uh, without further ado, and I'll be here to maybe interject and jump in, but I'm going to let Brian come up and kind of steer us through what Erie Hack 2017 was like and why we're so fired up about 1819. So, with with partners like this, it makes my job a lot easier because I can just send Paul around to talk. <laughs> And he does it so much better than I ever will. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Brian Stubbs, Executive Director of the Cleveland Water Alliance. We're a water innovation cluster. And what that means is we bring in research, academic institutions, businesses, utility, governmental agencies to drive new technologies, new innovation, new ways of thinking through how we deal with water. Um, and uh, you know, to that point is we take a basin-wide scale in terms of who we work with. So most organizations, you know, for one reason or another, they work maybe just in Detroit, or God forbid they just work in the state of Michigan or the state of Ohio. 
We said, doesn't work that way, innovation can't work that way, how do we work with Michigan, Ohio, New York, and woo, what about a province like Ontario? So that's the uh, perspective that we've taken that we've brought in. Um, I just thought, you know, quickly, just give you an idea of what we did in 2017, and then just one of the key takeaways is, you know, Paul will be rolling out uh, information sessions here soon uh, for the next innovation competition. Um, those will be held at Tech Town, so that'll be a good way to kind of get more information, to get engaged, uh, to get excited. So as mentioned, we, you know, we went all the way around the lake. Uh, so we got Windsor, Detroit, Toledo, Cleveland, Erie, PA, and Buffalo all engaged. Uh, we, we approach this in you know, a very much you know, similar fashion to how we're going to do it this next year where you know, we, we had, um, you know, while we had an official launch date, uh, we had a lot of information sessions leading up to it. Every one of those cities had information sessions and then we actually kicked it off. So for next year, uh, we'll be kicking it off at, we haven't even set the date, but it'll be, January Jan it'll, will be in January. <laughs> Um, where teams can actually register. Um, we do this kind of like, if those familiar with a, a NCAA basketball tournament bracket, uh, we have each region kind of engineer their own little mini competition. And out of that, you know, each region then brings in anywhere from two to four of their best teams into a semifinal. Uh, and that happens in Detroit. It's going to happen again here at Tech Town uh, for 2019. And then from there, we have yet another kind of, you know, who's, who's left at the end of it. And those all come, those final teams come to Cleveland. So for last year, we actually awarded about uh, $78,000 in actual hard cash, about another 50000 in ongoing innovation support services. Those innovation support services are actually still ongoing, and we'll talk about how that's working to some of the teams that we're still uh, working with. But here was one of the very first cool things that we did, never been done before. We have a partnership with NASA. Uh, thankfully, we have a, a research center in Cleveland called NASA Glenn, and they have this creativity and innovation team. So we went together with NASA to every one of those cities and we held innovation sessions. We wanted to hear one from the water community, but also from that technology uh, and IT and entrepreneurial communities on what do they think the problems are and can we put people in the room together who had never been in the room together and sure enough that's what happened we didn't have a lot of sexy IT technology startups in the water space three years ago but because of this today we do because now the IT community the entrepreneurial community sees the value and sees the opportunity which is uh, significant so we came up with these challenge statements that were part of what we were solving for um, the very first one, which wasn't a shock to us, but it was good to have it reinforced, was nutrient loading. So if anybody's here seen a harmful algal bloom, that's because of excess uh, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus into Lake Erie. So what can we do around that? We reduce and remediate urban pollution. Now we're getting into the, the green storm water as well as legacy uh, components. Resilience, you know, that's a big deal. Um, the climate's changing, and are we prepped, and are we thinking through infrastructure through that lens of resiliency? Aging infrastructure, obviously a hot issue throughout the Great Lakes region, any of our industrial cities. Connect, and then connecting communities to the value of water. Uh, we just felt there's a disconnect there. And then the sixth one was, and this one was one of the big takeaways, drive the use or the creation of meaningful data. There's a lot of water, water quality, water information data out there, but it's not well organized, curated. It's not made accessible to, to people like Tech Town in which to create new business models and business ideas out of. So what can we do to do that? So those were our challenges. Um, some of the stand out, stand out, and you're gonna hear from one of the teams here that was from Wayne State in, in a minute, which was microbrewery, Brewery. Boy, I just, I just got off the road from uh, a big water convention in New Orleans. And it's there's Friday. Two, He's thinking about the brewery. Give him, he there's, gets a pass. There's two big things going on in terms of the networking socializing hour, and that's reuse brewing. Um, and then a company we work with called Xylem actually is now doing reuse water for winemaking. So that's where my head was, just so you guys know. Um, Water Warriors was a team out of Akron that developed a handheld spectrometer for nutrient uh, loading for citizen science. Um, just an amazing group of team. You know, Purely was out of Ann Arbor, a gamification around water for water 
water utilities. Um, Extreme Comms was a team out of uh, University at Buffalo that was doing underwater telemetry or underwater Wi-Fi for, for most of us. Um, and this really cool one um, called Z-Spools. So we did a high school version of this and you know, we didn't know what we would get out of this. A 17-year-old out of university or out of Buffalo, out of the public schools there, came up with probably the most exciting solution, which was she was noticing on the beaches in Buffalo there are all these invasive mussel shells, zebra mussel shells. You step on them, they catch your feet. So the city has to come through with a backhoe and literally clean these up weekly, if not more often than weekly. Well, she, she got a hold of these mussel shells and realized they had a really inter interesting material to them. So she ground them up and combined them with some other polymers and realized it's a great uh, product for 3D printing. And so sure enough, she actually created a filament for 3D printing out of these zebra mussel shells. With her winnings, we got her a provisional patent on the process. She since won another $5,000 and got her full patent. And then one of our uh, industry partners, a big, large international firm called Eaton, actually has delivered her an MOU. Uh, so this is taking biomimicry approach to new, new and next generation of 3D printing filament. So you know that's the sort of things that have come out of this. Uh, you're going to hear from, uh, from our friends at MicroBuoy on where they're going in a minute, so I'm not going to steal their thunder. But those are the sort of solutions that we got out of this. Um, so we did have a couple videos, but I'm going to see if they're going to work. But I think it'd be cool to see the video we created for um, uh, the high school. Yeah, we've got time. The high school uh, team, just to give you an idea of kind of where we're going with this. High School Hackathon is a one-day abbreviated version of the two-month Erie Hack program. We've brought together students from Buffalo, Columbus, Cleveland, Akron, and Windsor, Ontario. We wanted to separate our hackers from the main competition to be uh, among people their own age and their own skill level in a singular challenge, which was to connect communities to the value of water. Hacking the lake is a brilliant idea and bringing the whole ecosystem together where we're all problem solving for something that affects every life in this entire region. If you learn the fundamental skills of being an effective problem solver, which makes you by default an entrepreneur, you really can design your future. You can work in any industry you want if you are a valued problem solver. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Entrepreneurial careers, but really becoming lifelong problem solvers. That's today's topic. What we're working on is an application for water events. Uh, our application is called EvDrop, for example, um, water collection at Lake Erie. What we've also added is an SMS client because we know that not everyone has a smartphone to download this app. I uh, collected a few, uh, a little sample here um, of zebra and quokka mussel shells that um, you can find uh, numerous piles on Lake Erie's beaches. And sort of the issue of these shells is that they're um, very sharp and impede be beachgoers from locking their foot on the beach. To solve this, I figured out a way to sort of grind up the shells and make them into sort of a powder um, that you can coat with uh, PLA pellets which is actually used uh, for 3D printing. As an organization, Cleveland Water Alliance, we want to foster and create this ecosystem for innovation. Uh, so we're trying to develop these ongoing programs like Erie Hack uh, to really identify unique opportunities and unique challenges that face Lake Erie. The Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District is always looking for ways to be innovative with our stormwater and our sewer system projects. And any way that we can add innovation to our projects will be a benefit not only to Greater Cleveland, but obviously to our customers as well. It's so nice to be able to come together with kids like-minded and try to think of a solution for everyday problem we face. Yeah, I met my partner about like an hour ago. Um, and I initially, I came here planning on working on my own, but fortunately I found someone um, who has a sort of a 3D printing background. We've known each other actually since from grade school, and now we go to high school together. We just w attended a hackathon, Massey Hacks, at our high school itself. We were working on this project, and we won the award for connecting community to value of water, and now we're here. Me and Camille go to school together, and Josh and Joseph go to school together, and we all were sitting at the same table, so we decided that we'd all work together build a stronger group. The groups that are just meeting today and having to come up with a problem have a much bigger uh, hill to climb and we're spending more time with them. I think the mentors are trying to help them focus and, and particularly get it down. We gave them one pitch in particular out of the possible pitches from the Erie Hack, which is really about uh, making people aware of water issues. And so we've tried to get them to take what is often a kind of a tech focused 
approach and turn it around so that they can raise awareness about water issues. I'm always amazed at the amount of work that they can get done in a short period of time is staggering. So right now we're probably three hours into the and there are teams that are already forming very, very thoughtful, uh, creative, and uh, very plausible ideas. Our idea starting off is trying, is trying to face the water issue in Flint, Michigan, which is that there is lead in the water and is it affecting the population and it's causing diseases. And I feel like we should tell people and be like, yo, like, we need to fix this now before it affects us later on. And now we can use algae bloom to um, clean water because that's one of the things that could fix innovation. Our team is specifically working on urban pollution and the solutions that we could take to help with that. Like we wanted to use types of robots and maybe like a phone application to help people point out different areas where there is pollution so we can then send out the robots to help clean up these areas. We're going to have four teams pitch in the final contest pitching. The, the younger crowd now that's going to be coming up with the ideas, they are going to be leading in the future. So it's very important to get them involved at the early stages before they have the commitments of family and job and everything else. We're putting the, the, uh, the planet in the hands of the youth and it's like, you know what, I'm very excited about this. It is very clear that uh, the world is changing very fast. One of the things that we are interested in is developing smart, connected communities. This is one way to get uh, engaged with the local community of uh, students and see how we can address local problems here and opportunities. So we wanted to make a platform so people can be aware of the progress that they're making at any given moment and make sure that people have a way to find out how they can make a difference in their community and connect to the values of water. If we can't fix water problems here in our country, how can we go help different countries across the world? Well, this are two tools that have already been uh, manufactured. So the only thing that we're doing is just putting it to a good use. Now the product we'll be selling will be schools when it's pictured. There is a market for 3D printing already. So $500 and second prize, $1,000 going to first prize. Coming in second, Lake E, and coming in first, Z Schools. So, you know, a lot of things came out of this. You know, one, we're actually uh, driving, we've got business starts out of this new technology, driving solutions for our water challenges and our water um, um, needs. Uh, to that, to that, um, you know, to that point, um, you know, one of the teams, the one out of Akron, is just finalizing the $400,000 Team. There are SBIRs in the works to get federal funding to get their innovation out of the lab and into the marketplace. So this is having meaningful impact, but also the metrics around changing. Oh, he wants to. She wants to go uh, pull the mic. There you go. Loud enough. There we go. Um, we're we're also changing um, those that want to go into this space. And then one of the final things I wanted to note is. Um, you know, two things, and then we can go into Q&As. Um, one was the amount of national and international attention this got. This was covered by NPR, All Things Considered, during drive time, so we got a lot of attention for our communities. It's no longer thinking through this lens of Rust Belt, but thinking through the lens of technology and innovation. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is for, for 2019, we're adding one additional challenge, which is gonna be around water equity. Um, that's something very near and dear to our Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District in Cleveland water uh, for us within our space. And I have a feeling it's going to be near and dear to our other partners in our space. So um, I, I'll pause there and see if Paul has anything he'd yeah, like to add. I was just going to interject um, that I was putting together actually and looking at what Brian had shared many months ago and I hadn't revisited, but the laundry list of the media coverage, it was probably three, four dozen easily of national and even global and local and regional and, and television and, and print press and social media impressions. Just a huge level of interest and excitement that this produced. And what we didn't mention is that um, 
This moved actually to Cleveland for the finals. So uh, there were six or eight teams that actually were able to come from the six cities um, that were selected as semifinalists to come on, or I should say finalists, onto um, Cleveland and, and, and pitch there in a large conference in front of a, uh, a lot of stakeholders and a lot of decision makers in the water and environmental space, uh, which was amazing. And then one of the last, I think, core or, or key surprises was that even for those who didn't win, um, it was so exciting and amazing to, to have a lot of these companies to be able to still continue, even if it wasn't with that idea, that the level of excitement and energy around environmental solutions and technology and leveraging technology to bring these solutions forward, they continue with those. They continue beyond Erie Hack. So it, was, it served as this catalyst in our city and our region that we look forward to building upon in 2018-19, but it really just stirred up a whole new group and cohort of people who we really hadn't tapped into and just weren't aware that they cared so much, nor did they have these great um, innovative ideas around water technology. So you can see the, uh, the depth and the, 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 the breadth, I should say, I guess, of, of partners. And um, a lot of those here, we partnered um, with Windsor, our friends across the border, so it's bi-national, bi, you know, um, regional, even in this area, um, which was awesome. So um, without that, I think that we've gotten our, our uh, yeah, signal, so we're willing to take questions about it and then have the micro buoy team come up and pitch, or I should say present. Not pitch. <laughs> Any questions at all? Well, we didn't do that well. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry? Um, well, this serves Michigan and, <clears throat> I'm sorry, um, two or three other states. <clears throat> so Michigan, particularly southeastern Michigan, including Oakland County. We saw uh, uh, participants from Washtenaw County, Oakland County, Wayne County, Macomb County, um, as well as uh, Essex County over in Windsor, Ontario. So it's absolutely um, deeply centered and in, 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 in basically uh, you know, uh, led here in, in Michigan, and Michigan participates heavily. So yes, absolutely. And they will again in 1819. And I'll just add quickly to that, there's not a water innovation cluster like the Cleveland Water Alliance in Michigan. Um, but that being said, that's you know why we are here, because we feel it's more about the whole region and not just a particular state. And a lot of our partners, on, especially on the industry side, are here. Uh, so as an example, we're working right now on a harmful algal bloom warning system in partnership with a company out of Ann Arbor called Limnotech and then the Great Lakes Observing System, which is also out of Ann Arbor. So we really consider Michigan to be, you know, part of the whole ecosystem. No, we're working on that right now for, for this spring. And, and thankfully, we've, we've got a partner out of a little town in downstate Ohio called Yellow Springs. And they have a company called Yellow Springs Instruments, which develops a lot of the water quality monitor um, sensors internationally. And one of their research um, folks actually developed one for their high school um, locally. So we're taking that and starting to integrate that. And also with colleges. Last year with the colleges it was more of people wanted to participate and they did and they came to the info sessions. This year we're actually looking at how do we develop that curriculum. So, and the quick case in point there is last week I did a joint um, Erie Hack uh, curriculum class with both Case Western and Cleveland State together. So we're not only getting those students involved as part of their curriculum, but also we're combining more than one institution together, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, we're excited about the opportunity to run a kind of a microcosm of the larger Erie Hack Summit in, in, in competition. But at a high school level, it kind of builds up to a single day. But we look to bring that to Detroit, which would be the first time. I think in 2017, three or four of the other participating cities ran high school level competitions as well, as shown in the video. So we look at, we're, we're excited about the thought and the notion and the opportunity to do that here in southeastern Michigan as well. I'm hopeful we're going to do a, a high school curriculum component for Detroit for this spring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, last but not least, this is the uh, Erie Hack Innovation Challenge winning team presentation. This is called Next Generation Real-Time Water Sensor Integrated with High Power Miniaturized Batteries. Whew. We have Dr. Leela. Uh, 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 oh, it's not me. It's not uh, okay, uh, uh, they were the CEO of Microbuoy Inc., uh, Wayne State students, uh, Nairul Ma Mazukar, who's the presenter. Uh, okay, <laughs> you're Sandeep Varma, and is Uday Praveen here yeah, also? Okay, there you go. Uh. Hello, everyone. My name is Sandeep. <laughs> so I'm here to talk about microbuoy. So I'm going to tell about what we achieved over the last one year and uh, why we created microbuoy and uh, why are we working on water sensors? So microbuoy was created uh, by four individuals. Uh, uh, my, our advisor, Dr. Leela Arawa from Wayne State and three other graduate students from Wayne State. Uh, me, Praveen, and uh, Nirul over there. Uh, we started uh, microbuoy with an intention to create uh, a, a solution for uh, next generation wa uh, water detection sensors. So there was this uh, contamination in Flint that affected uh, like thousands of people. There was this huge amount of le uh, lead contamination which was undetected for a couple of days. This was uh, only due to uh, the inefficiency of sensors. There were no real-time water sensors. So people weren't aware that their water was contaminated and they were just consuming the water. And uh, the other important thing that motivated us was uh, the Great Lakes. So as uh, Brian has talked before, uh, you, you guys all know what's happening in the Great Lakes. Uh, the contaminants is due to the runoff from the farm fields. The nutrients and the phosphorus is running off to the Great Lakes and it's causing uh, green algal blooms. That is both uh, dangerous for the ecosystem and for the neighboring states of uh, the Great Lakes. So we want to like uh, stop uh, the big problem from urban p pollution, the harmful algae, and heavy uh, metal accumulations from the li uh, rivers. So our approach was uh, we wanted to work with new sensor technology that could match the EPA standards. Uh, these need to be high re uh, resolution and uh, fast. They, sh they should be in fast and response. And these sensors need to be autonomous because uh, you want something to work on, it o on its own and you get the values from the sensor. And uh, these should have long range communication capabilities. So, so far, uh, contaminants are detected uh, by taking water samples from the lakes. Uh, they take uh, the water samples back to the test facility, uh, analyze them, and give the report out. This usually takes half a day or a day for the report to come out, but that's too late. Uh, at the right scenario, we can't wait for that long. We need rapid detection. So in 2017 and 18, we worked on rapid detection sensors. You can see on, on the right side, uh, that's our app. So there you can see that the contamination detected by the increase in the current flowing over there. So in 2017, we had this competition called Erie Hack, where we, ha uh, where we uh, like, uh, prototyped a handheld microbuoy. This was our prototype which we used uh, during that Erie Hack. So this has three major components. One was a precision uh, nanomaterial sensor and uh, custom hardware that could collect all the data from the sensor. And the most important uh, part for the buoy is uh, the power. We had these miniaturized uh, batteries that we fabricated in our own lab. I'm going to tell you in detail about uh, these batteries. And this is a prototype too. Uh, this we created so that we could uh, leave these uh, autonomous buoys in the Great Lakes so they could detect uh, contaminants from the uh, lakes every, every other minute. So this uh, autonomous buoy is mainly divided into three parts. We had a sensor module 
which has uh, pathogens, phosphorus, pH, heavy metals, and temperature sensors, and a microcontroller system with uh, communication unit for long distance communication. We had our power management unit with uh, solar energy harvesting and uh, in house fabricated lithium uh, sulfur battery technology. So, over here, uh, the game changer was uh, our sensor technology and the battery technology. The batteries we included in the buoy were uh, lasting for a long time. Uh, they were lasting around for three, three months on a single charge. And if you have the solar energy charging the circuit, it's going to like, uh, stay along for a while. So as I said before, uh, we created this uh, miniaturized battery. You can see the battery over there. Uh, this is uh, like three millimeter by three millimeter and just cost $4. The main reason behind creating these batteries was uh, we needed something that has high ca uh, capacity. Okay, the commercial capa uh, capacity of these batteries is pretty low, but ours was pretty high. And these batteries were thermally stable at harsh temperatures, but uh, the commercial solutions were not uh, even closer. Then we wanted something that has longer discharge time. Our uh, batteries had 40 hours of discharge time. When, com uh, when compared to commercial ones, uh, it was 15 hours. Uh, so the other important thing was uh, our uh, sensors. We had two different kinds of sensors. One was uh, interdistal fingers. Uh, it's, uh, it's a grid of parallel fing uh, like finger type structure. So what, is, what it does is uh, when there's contamination that comes in contact with these, uh, uh, the, the gaps, it's going to detect the contaminants. You can see that uh, on a finger nail, you can see that uh, how small the sensor is. It just costs us around 60 cent to make each sensor. This is uh, fabricated in bulk mode, so we had the cost reduced. And the other thing is uh, we incorporated a three electrode system. It's uh, similar to the commercially available three electrode system, but what changed was our working electrode. We had a uh, a uh, nanomaterial uh, electrode uh, system incorporated. This could uh, help us in faster detection of phosphorus. And uh, oops, the video is supposed to play. Okay. I'm sorry guys, I think the video is not playing. So what we did over there was uh, we had this, uh, the interdigital uh, sensor which I told you, and uh, we had phosphorus solution and dissolved phosphorus solution and we just drop casted it onto the electrode and uh, we could see instantly and rapidly the, 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 the graph was, uh, there were peaks on the graph showing that uh, this is detection of phosphorus. And after the results were done, we could see that our system was uh, 10 times more uh, sensitive than commercial solutions. And it was fast in response, it has high stability. And, I said, uh, and as I said before, uh, it, was, uh, it was inexpensive. It was not that expensive. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't think this video is also playing right now. So what this was, uh, it was a handheld buoy that we just dropped into a water tank and we put some pH solution into the water tank. So what it did was uh, within a couple of seconds, okay. So within a couple of seconds, what it uh, did was uh, it just uh, rapidly showed us data telling that the pH was around 7.5. That was what the pH solution we dropped. So that was uh, one. And our implementation was uh, we set up uh, micro buoys. We compared uh, our la uh, lab tests with deployment tests. Uh, and uh, another aim was to retire conventional test procedures and uh, identify next locations on the lake uh, near the Sandusky Bay of the Great Lakes where our buoys can be deployed. And uh, this was uh, our deployment results. We incorporated three sensors, phosphorus, pH and temperature. So these were the exact data that we got from the test sites. Uh, so the first chart in blue, you can see that it's, it's indicating the phosphorus value over there. And uh, the phosphorus value was close, around, close to around like 36 micrograms per liter. This was uh, almost the possible value that we got from like 
confirmed from the uh, uh, test facility. So this made us, this gave us a good confident confidence that uh, our sensors were pretty accurate. And uh, yeah, this was the buoy which we deployed uh, on the top, where you can see a couple of wires. That's where the the, the controller and the long distance communication was incorporated. And this uh, and the sensor module was uh, inside the water. Uh, it's, uh, the video was supposed to play. I don't know why. Sorry. Yeah. So coming to the cost of manufacturing, uh, our buoy just cost us around two thousand to five thousand to manufacture. Right now, we are working on business model that could uh, reduce the cost even less because uh, once you have production larger scale, we we believe that our model predicts that uh, it, the cost is going to go down. Uh, the commercial uh, buoys cost us around forty thousand dollars. There are just a few in the Great Lakes, but using our uh, buoy, we could incorporate many buoys in the lake that could give us better uh, evaluation of what is the contaminant number. So this was our uh, deployment. We, we did uh, three deployments at two different sites. Uh, we, we, we took the sites uh, according to the, where they take the samples out so that we could match our results with the, the samples. And yeah, this was uh, some pictures from the deployment sites where we deployed uh, buoys into the water. Most of these parts were uh, carbon fiber and 3D printed. We had some uh, 3D printers in the lab so we could easily fabricate the design we wanted and uh, this was how it came into picture. So as Brian and uh, Paul said, we were the winners of the grand prize at ED Hack. Okay. Uh, we won a grand prize of fifty thousand dollars, and. Uh, the prize money was awarded uh, for our uh, innovation in uh, sensors, innovation in batteries, coming up with a complete approach for the solution. And uh, after that, we used the money to move, like, uh, move the product even to a further stage. So yeah, this was Paul from the Tech Town and the other teammates uh, of, of MicroBuoy. Yeah, this is another image uh, which we took from with Brian uh, Stubbs is here. Yeah. So, and the, and 2017, we had another competition, uh, in, uh, what was, uh, Internet of H2O. So during this, we had uh, real uh, deployments done, the, the deployments which I showed you before. So this was a continuation of ED hack. We, want, uh, we had an opportunity to move things even forward. So over here, we won a, a technology innovation award for $15,000. Yeah, this is our team, this is our advisor at the end. Uh, so the timeline, uh, we started at back in 2015. Uh, we had our sensors and the batteries fabricated long before we even thought of uh, what would be the applications, would, what would be the applications are. And uh, in 2016, we integrated the whole software and the hardware, started working with make things like autonomous, how do we make these things autonomous. And in 2017, we had this opportunity to present uh, the complete solution at ED Hack, and uh, we did that, and uh, that gave us good accomplishment. And right now, in 2018, we're trying to come up with a faucet design. So what are we doing is, uh, it's going to be a small uh, filter kind of structure that we're going to put in like the kitchen faucets. So if you're drinking water from the kitchen tap, it's going to tell you what, what is the contaminant level, okay? So yeah, we, we are trying to incorporate E. coli sensor as well in the water faucet. That's our idea. And 2019, we're trying to commercialize uh, the buoys so that uh, it can be available for the general public. So thank you. So throughout our journey, we had a lot of support. Uh, Digital Sea was one of our supports, Cleveland Water Alliance, uh, Brian and uh, Max were our partners from there. Uh, Erie Hack, where we won our $50,000 cash prize, and Tech Town was a backbone just beside Wayne State University, we were always there, uh, and Internet of H2O. So this was our team, 
that's Nirul, is over here. He designs uh, sensors and uh, fabricates the batteries. And Praveen works on product designing. He comes with new innovative products where we could incorporate our sensors and packaging all the stuff together. I work on hardware and uh, software interface, and that's our mentor, Dr. Leela Rava. And these are the two new students who are working with us on hardware and uh, software support. They're also here with us. Thank you, guys. Yes. Uh, I'll ask Nirul to help me out with that. Is 0.01 microgram per liter for that sensitivity of that sensor? Any questions? Oh, it's over there. Last question. Just curious, what's the cost of these going to be when they hit the market? So, um, already Sandeep has shown you, like, our manufacturing cost of this sensor is for phosphorus, it's like 20 bucks. $20, but uh, when we will introduce in the market, it will be like $40, $50. There are some phosphorus sensors that's already available. It's like bulky, this much. And they use uh, like meter, and that costs like $20,000. And this will be like in $200, you can get that phosphorus sensor. So these players do the assembly? Yeah, we already assembled that phosphorus sensor in that buoy. But you can buy it like uh, individual sensors also. Right. So we haven't caught up in a few weeks, but um, I'm curious on what your thinking is right now in terms of telemetry. You know, how are you bouncing the data off of these uh, moving forward? And to to his question, would you commercialize it? Will it be with uh, you know more cellular, or will it be have the ability for let's say satellite and aerial? Uh, so these sensors are like a. a like uh, Adafruit sensors. If you go in the Adafruit website and you can buy the temperature sensor for there, all the connections are there. You can interface this sensor with uh, any Raspberry Pi or uh, what the other one is Arduino or other things. You can connect it or you can connect with the, some s satellites also with the help of the those PCBs available in Adafruit. So it has a three connection output. You can integrate with anything. So. Uh, these sensors can be connected to cellular and Wi-Fi. So the next product that we are currently in development is a smart faucet. How many of you think that you are drinking safe water from the tap, from your kitchen? Okay, that's a good number of hands. But uh, these smart faucets help us uh, give a solution. Like as soon as you turn on the tap, you get a notification on your phone saying that, uh, okay, this is the temperature of the water right now. This is the nutrient content inside or the phosphorus content. So that particular faucet is connected over Wi-Fi, but these buoys are connected with cellular network. Oh yeah, this was uh, the video which was supposed to play. So that was the handheld buoy which we dropped into the water tank, and that was a pH sensor which we pour into that. So once uh, uh, it dissolves into the water tank uh, after a few seconds, in a few seconds you should be uh, <laughs> yeah, there it goes, yeah. Uh, this was the phosphorus test, uh, which was supposed to, yeah. Are you going to see a spike in the graph over there? Yeah. Any questions? How did you guys learn? How did you, I never asked, but how did you hear about and learn about Erie Hack? Erie Hack, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we got this email notification from our advisor. He said, uh, this is water competition going on. Why don't you go and have a talk, like well, find out what's network with people and find out, because we were interested, we had the sensors. So uh, we thought, it's okay, let's, let's forget it. But our professor said that there was free pizza over there. 
So we thought, okay, let's have free pizza. <laughs> The rest is history. Can you ask one more time? She's asking if at the Zoom deposit, is there going to be any complications or with the Wi-Fi or the cellular network? Uh, no, I think uh, battery consists of like, um, it doesn't work on frequencies. Battery doesn't have the frequencies coming out there. So I don't think so it's going to interact with this, the communication network. As soon as you turn on that app, it just sends out a short uh, burst of a signal and gives out the enough information for you to see it on the phone. So it's not like our cellular device where it constantly look for uh, good connectivity. These smart devices are, uh, they are smart, so they only turn on themselves when they are only required to turn on, so. So there's no larger sleep cycle and wait. Yeah, I'll show you that. Uh, So this, uh, so this is we have done in our lab of these batteries. So you can see that three minutes we turn off that battery. There is only the boot up sensors are on, and once this uh, sensor and the telemetry section is on, this battery takes a power off. So we turn off all this thing in three minutes, and only for a few seconds when we need the data, that time only we turn off the battery and other uh, telemetry. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Uh, we would like to thank the organizers for the, of the summit for giving us a chance to like present Micro Buoy. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you. Oh. I am incredibly impressed by this. This is, this is what I'm saying. The young folks are going to save us. Now, pretty much everybody's young folks when you're my age, but um, this, is, this is the generation that's going to save the problems that my generation caused. So I'm glad to see that, and, I, and I, I'm really impressed. Um, this, one of the things that Pure Oakland Water has wanted to do for a while is get involved with high school students because we do um, uh, watershed festivals for third and fourth graders. We do a bunch of stuff, uh, scholarships and internships for college students. We haven't really been able to contact and really get into high school students because in my mind, if you can catch a kid in high school, if you can catch your imagination in high school, they are going to follow that right through college and into a career. So if we can get kids interested in this stuff in high school, we are going to be much better off in the generations to come. So we're reaching out. We want to get involved with the, uh, with the high school hack um, next year, and we're looking to do this. Um, we want to work with you guys. Um, this is something that really, I think, is just dear to my heart. This is, this is what we have to do for this next generation. Um, and, I'm, and I'm happy to be a part of that. So we look forward to working with you guys. There we go. Um, and I just want to thank everybody for coming today. I think I learned a lot here, and I hope you guys did. I uh, hope we'll come back next year. Thanks so much.